Two years ago, I had the opportunity, as many at Roper, to meet the incredible and unique mind of Adrit. Adrit is an av is avid lover of physics, where there exists a paradox, when two states can sometimes exist simultaneously. I will now present my case for a new paradox called Adrit. Adrit is a young man with a bright, a bright mind that can be in two states at the same time and, and be perceived differently by the, by the viewer. When Adrit attended my Spanish class, he was full of self-doubt and paralyzed when he had to write his first composi composition, and yet he understood everything I said in Spanish and was in fact one of the best students. Over time, he gained confidence and participated in class, aided exams and mastered projects. In fact, he finished his work so quickly that I discovered his phone addiction and realized that the device is a refuge for a quick mind that gets easily bored. Adrit also used the phone as a shield against the outside world. Adrit can be perceived as disinterested, but I witnessed him as wonderful problem questions during an alumni presentation when I thought his mind was storing another state of mind through the phone. Adrit experienced some real challenges during his high school years, but he seems to have crossed over to the other side of them, where I like in my Spanish class, he became confident and able to have great success. Adrit learned to read at two, at two and a half years of age. He had a successful middle school experience at Stepping Stone, a school for gifted students, and his parents believed he was ready for the International Academy. A raising junior, Adrit felt unmotivated and bored by classes described as regimented, repetitive, and non-value added. Falling behind and losing self-confidence, he suffered stress, anxiety, and affected his self-esteem and motivation. When Adrit arrived at Roper, he was perceived as a puzzling paradox to adults. Paddy Boswick told me that Adrit had qualified as a national merit semi-finalist as the result of the PSAT taken the previous year. At Roper, he needed to requalify, but he inexplicably declined our introduction to inexplicably declined our introduction to the Adrit paradox. His first year at Roper proved difficult, but Adrit started his last year with energy and positivity for which he credits caring teachers parents and friends who helped him develop the skills he was lacking while providing emotional support and making him feel welcome and member of the school community. As he made friends at the physics and tabletop clubs, I saw relaxed and loving Adrit. Adrit wants to thank all for this care and assistance. I, I concur with Adrit parents who describe him as sensitive, very emotional and committed to giving 100% to achieve his full potential. I think I better understand Adrit's paradox after knowing him for the past two years and witnessing his struggles and achievements. Adrit, you are a wonderful human being. I love you and admire your brilliant mind, and I know you will find your comfort level. I also wish to you to, for, to make an effort to abandon your phone and look into the eyes and of people who are with you so they don't, they don't perceive you as an interest while your mind is actually asking a million questions and paying a close attention. Remember, humans cannot read minds. Adrit, I know that you're anxious about next year, but I have no doubt that your intelligence and kindness will make great strides at Michigan State, where you will pursue engineering and computer science. The only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking, don't settle. Hannah used this quote by Steve Jobs when she was asked to share why she wanted to come to Roper as a junior. She added, I desire to change schools at this point in my education because I desire a school that inspires and encourages my passions and expands my dreams for the future. Looking back at her two years at Roper, Hannah knows that she made the right choice. She is grateful for the opportunity she was given to pursue her interest in science and is also thankful for the welcome, support, and understanding that she received. Hannah's teachers were more than grateful for their new student. You fit right in. One of the smoothest new student transitions I have ever seen, English teacher Kelly McDowell remarked. Physics teacher Andrew Blackman wrote, I am impressed by your dedication to learning material and your desire to really understand mistakes you have made, taking advantage of every retake opportunity, even when it might not have been necessary, but just to make sure you get most out of the experience. Spanish teacher Eulalia Ferrar summed up a typical class with Hannah saying, you arrive every day to class ready to learn and with a smile. You are an incredible student and human being. You are magic. When asked what word she would use to describe her daughter, mom Susan wrote, 
strong, articulate, compassionate, inquisitive, intelligent, analytical, and kind. Of these many attributes, her most outstanding is her empathy and kindness. And as many friends agree, she's the nicest person I've ever met in my life, Jacob Badney says. If you need a friend, she's always there. Alexa Miller says Hannah's genuine kindness brings joy into the lives of everyone who gets to know her. While Annalise Ibanescu shares, I'm just so happy I have someone like her in my life. Josh Fins reveals that Hannah is often described as Bubbles from the Powderpuff Girls. A Google search tells that Bubbles is the joy and the laughter, and one of Bubbles' powers is that she can talk to the animals. Hannah is simply just an animal person, Josh said when asked what is most important to Hannah. Straight up animals and not in a weird way. Hannah has worked as a counselor at the Darien Nature Center, as well as a volunteer at the Detroit Zoo to help educate young people on the aspects of the environment and significance of plants and animals in our world. Hannah's love of animals was showcased in her Cedar project. She wrote that while my initial intention was to host an animal adoption event at the end of the year, the project evolved into the realm of animal homelessness, welfare, and how the coronavirus pandemic has affected animal shelters. Hannah has decided that Michigan State University, where she will major in zoology, will be the next school that encourages her passions and expands her dreams for the future. I am honored to present Hannah Elizabeth Byrne. Christian has only been at Roper these last two years, but in that time, he's already made something of an institution of himself. Whether it's powering through a track practice, challenging teachers to push up competitions, or asking tons of questions about torque, Christian has always stood out. Christian can make friends with anyone. His math teacher from his old school, Linda Sedlak, tells how as a freshman, he joined her Honors Algebra II class with several upperclassmen. Not only was he able to hold his own with them, he was also able to help a struggling student with multiple tricks of his infamous calculator. She describes Christian as a heart of gold, and this shows whether helping an Algebra II student with a calculator shortcut or showing local French teacher Michael McConville how to check her car's tire pressure and maybe giving an impromptu lesson on car safety in our parking lot for her and several nearby students, all just out of the kindness of his heart. His friend, Avery Long, talks a lot about his passion. Christian lives by his own terms and means, he says. He is always ready to have a good time and do what he loves. Moreover, he truly devotes himself to his passions, yet nothing means more to him than his friends and his family. If Christian decides to stick by you, then there he will stay. And I'm thankful that I can count myself among his friends. His honesty, humor, humility, integrity, kindness, and respect are valuable traits. And while I may curse his name during a wait session together, I never doubt that he's with me at every moment of improvement. He wants nothing but the best for those around him. Christian's can-do attitude and fun-loving sense of humor have powered him through many challenges in his short but infamous Roper career. He talks about how he might have uh, accidentally miscalculated how much magnesium he put into dry ice to show a demo for sixth graders in advanced chemistry, uh, causing a small fire that sort of accidentally burned through the tray in the chemistry room. Uh, or how he might have inadvertently forgotten to include a proper regulator for the new pneumatic system that he advocated for on the Roper robot, causing the uh, entire robot to spectacularly flip over when it lifted its arm. Friend Will Hoover describes Christian's primary trait as stubbornness. If he finds out that something is wrong, he will not budge until he finds out not only what is going on, but how he can help. He is always willing to talk to anyone for long periods of time if the need arises. Former chemistry teacher Jamie Benigna says, I have appreciated Christian's fun-loving nature and sense of humor. He certainly revels in learning and doesn't take things too seriously. Yet when it's time to attend new information or work collaboratively, Christian is focused and efficient. In advanced physics, he was often the same way, asking questions constantly and refusing to accept anything less than full understanding. If something wasn't working in a lab, I would have to tell him to stop working and accept the data to avoid him spending hours trying to get it right. Everyone, everyone, says Christian's passion is his car. 
a 2004 Honda Accord he wired up with an insane sound system that, he is proud to say, only blew up three times. Linda Vernon talks about how, from Christian's point of view, the whole quarantine thing was a blessing since it meant he was able to take his computer outside and show his homeroom mates the most recent improvements without interruption. From almost the very first day I met Christian in physics, he was asking me about anything he could think of. Our class was the last block of the day, so when I would hear after class, Hey, Andrew, can I ask you something real quick? I quickly learned that I should be ready for a good half hour long conversation about some random aspect of automotive or electrical engineering at a minimum. We had some really wonderful dis discussions and I learned several things about cars just based on the questions that he would come up with. But if cars are his hobby, his real passion is for flight and he will be studying aerospace engineering through the University of Michigan's Air Force ROTC program with a dream of becoming a fighter pilot and perhaps retiring his military commission to become a commercial aviator. I asked him if he wanted to become an astronaut, and he says that if they offer, he'll say yes. I sure hope they do, because if he gets a chance to go up, he might finally be able to see how a pen spins in outer space, and that debate will finally be settled. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to present new Roper alum, Christian Henderson. Most of you do not know that Victoria spent the first five years of her life in an orphanage in the Ukraine. She remembers being terrified when she first came to the United States. She did not speak any English, had never seen an airplane, a cat, or a dog, or any kind of technology. Even though she has been through so much as a young child, she doesn't feel sorry for herself, nor does she complain about it, friend Tracy Stanzik says. Victoria still has such a great attitude and a wonderful outlook on her life. I can't say enough about how much I admire her. Victoria uses eager to learn and curious to describe herself. I just want to know everything, she says. One opportunity that Victoria took full advantage of was learning how to be a gymnast. For nine years until injuries forced her to quit, she spent hours training and learning the discipline to stay focused on her goals. Gymnastics also taught me how to balance not just my body, but also my life, how to balance school, work, and my health. I also learned determination. You have to be determined to learn new skills, face fears, accomplish goals, compete fearlessly, and stay positive. Victoria used all of these qualities when she came to Roper for her sophomore year. Changing into a new high school can be stressful and difficult process, especially when the student is functioning with English as their second language. Frustrated because she didn't know all the words, Victoria was still determined to do well in her classes. Her teachers applaud her efforts. Your willingness to work and be engaged in the process is remarkable, and I have no doubt that it will continue to be part of your personality that defines your success in the future, Susanna Nichols wrote. Outside of Roper, Victoria shows the same resolve to be her best self. Victoria's boss, Patricia Willard, says, You can count on Victoria to give 100% every time she shows up to work. She brings positivity and strength to our team. She holds herself and others accountable to go above and beyond what is expected. Our teacher, Sarah Mendez, remembers when Victoria was in sculpture class and an admissions house uh, tour was happening. A mom and her eighth grade daughter were standing at the door, and you could tell that, Vic that the daughter's interest was piqued by what was going on in the art room, Sarah says. Victoria went over to the girl and brought her into the room and spent 20 minutes talking with her. She made her feel like she was part of the group. When asked what she sees Victoria doing 10 years from now, Sister Caroline says something in the field of sports medicine, health, or nutrition, taking care of herself in body and mind, owning a dog, doing art, or maybe being a MMA UFC fighter. Regardless of her career choice, I see Victoria in a role helping others, teacher Natalie Abbott says. She offered and did help me move, baked me a cake when I was feeling depressed, and has brought me so much joy over the years. I can't imagine having made it through my first years at Roper without her. It is my honor to present Victoria Susan Birch. Richard Lee's senior quote cannot be more appropriate in summarizing his character, personal success, and the impact he has on inspiring those around him. If you work really hard and you're kind, amazing things will happen. Conan O'Brien. Anyone who knows Richard understands that he is something like a force of nature. In the classroom, teachers and students alike consistently comment that he electrifies any classroom discussion or environment. 
As Susanna Nichols mentioned, you strike an impressive balance between being able to voice your own opinions and ideas with excitement and detail while not taking over the conversation. Furthermore, Nichols emphasized that Richard is one who goes all in with his mind and his heart. Kelly McDowell would agree. Richard is unafraid to go all in with whatever he's interested in, even or especially if it is challenging. The world needs more deep thinkers like him. Richard is an academic powerhouse, and his hard work, dedication, and perseverance has enabled him to succeed in some exceptional ways. When asked what motivates Richard, not surprisingly, he responded, it is the challenge. The greater the, adver uh, the adversity, the more you want to push yourself. Outside of the classroom, Richard has found numerous ways to push himself, where his drive, leadership, and kind-heartedness really shine. Since entering Roper, Richard has been a game-changing contributor to Roper's Model United Nations and debate teams. For Model UN, Richard has put forth an astounding amount of effort in leading the team and training all delegates, new and old. Uh, Richard has been so successful in debate that he developed an entire debate curriculum for the school as his senior project. Richard loves debate so much that he has been known to call the Bloomberg campaign hotline and explain that people named Richard shouldn't have to pay taxes, leaving the campaign rep thoroughly confused. To list his accolades with debate and Model UN would be too lengthy, so it is probably safe to say that he has won everything. If asked why Richard enjoys Model UN and debate so much, he would tell you it enables him to learn how to be comfortable with taking risks, it helps him explore the unknown, and allows him to listen more and talk less, especially to those he disagrees with. He would also tell you it has taught him the importance of being firm and decisive. With all of this in mind, perhaps Richard's most notable impact over the years is simply that he is a wonderful human being and selflessly devotes himself to helping others. Friends describe Richard as wise, humble, ambitious, contemplative, and generous. If you ask Richard about his successes or personal growth over the years, he would give credit to his closest and most influential mentors, who include Joe Allen, Elliot Silk, Regis Carroza, and of course, his best friend and sister, Rose. Over the years, Richard has become a great mentor himself. Friend Francis Allen uh, describes him as always willing to help people out. He brings his knowledge and expertise into every conversation with friends. I can always count on Richard to read over an essay for me or answer questions about a course. He's been in, an incredibly influential mentor in my pursuits of debate and Model UN as well. He knows literally everything about these activities from the rule book to specific topics. Francis goes on to say, Richard embodies the true spirit of a hard worker. Seeing him forego attendance at big sporting events in favor of completing a debate case or ensuring that underclassmen write their position papers on time inspires me. All would agree we are better for having Richard as a part of this community, and we are all ready to see Richard soar to new heights as he sets off for Cornell in the fall, pursuing his interests in business, finance, and government. Congratulations, Roper graduate, Richard Lee. At her core, Claire Dietz is a writer. One of her most significant accomplishments at Roper was conceptualizing and writing a novel under the guidance of Kelly Piontek. Over the course of two years, Claire drafted and revised this piece to the point where she was ready to submit it for publication. At the height of quarantine, Claire continued to churn out dozens of pages a day, and her creative writing stands alongside the reams of narrative and critical essays that have been met with glowing commentary during her time at Roper. Claire moves worlds within her mind and on the page, shares Kelly. She has the power to make her readers care deeply about her characters because she presses them and asks them to learn from their mistakes, because she understands the shape of narratives and what makes the heart tick, skitter, and thunder. All Claire's efforts reflect not only heartfelt authenticity, but also deliberate craftsmanship, a desire to find the perfect phrasing, the perfect message, the perfect connective Im imagery. I have always found the time I spend in the lines of Claire's writing to be meaningful and compelling. 
Sometimes great writers enchant us in ways that are somewhat escapist, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Spending time in a world like Tamarant or Ketterdam can often be preferable to the world we know. But Claire's gift as a writer and as a person is that she deliberately reaches beyond the safety of an escape. She writes instead to better understand and articulate the nuances, challenges, and wonders of the world, both for herself and her reader. All of Claire's modes of storytelling exemplify this ethos. According to dance teacher Amy Kova, Claire has an extraordinary way of embodying an idea and translating it into movement that is both engaging and enlightening. If you walked through the Nas Commons on an otherwise average lunch last year, you might have been suddenly riveted by a performance of Claire's, part of an ongoing series of student recitals. And you would have found yourself in awe of Claire's, of Claire's poise in those moments, at once unguarded and resolute. Claire's conscious choice to show such vulnerability is something that could easily become a hindrance, but instead has allowed her to grow. She is not afraid of being out of her element, as she was when she embarked on a language and cultural immersion program in Spain last summer. And closer to home, Claire sets a humble example by being willing to admit what she doesn't know. Civil rights teacher Erin Robinson observes that there were several moments during our classwork when Claire was deeply affected by the knowledge she was absorbing and wrangled with what it means to have privilege in, its, in many of its forms in our society. When Claire listens, her compassion is palpable. She is deeply loving in her relationships with people and backs up her emotions with action. She's my son Aldis's favorite babysitter and he'd often break into his bumbling sprint when he'd see her in the halls, eager to receive her gentle high fives and inquiries about his day. Twin sister Rachel appreciates that when Claire decides she wants to do something, she will follow through on the steps it takes to do it. It does not just remain an idea. That idea, Rachel clarifies, might be protecting a friend in a difficult moment, providing the kindest of counsel, or whipping up a prank where she needs Rachel as her partner in crime. Whatever the vision, Claire will see it through. Claire will embark on a new phase of her creative and academic life as she heads to Knox College. I know she will continue to create inspiring spaces, both on the page and in her own life. And others will be drawn to those spaces in the future, as I have been in the past, because when we're there, we're a little closer to getting to the heart of this world, each other, and ourselves. I'm so honored to present Roper graduate Claire Meyer Dietz. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go down and lie where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Earlier this spring, I heard this poem of Wendell Berry's, The Peace of Wild Things, which reflects on the solace that nature can provide in the most harrowing of times, and my mind flooded with memories of Rachel Dietz. I remember the myriad times she wandered into my room to talk, and in the course of our conversations, be they serious or mundane, the world would settle into a bit better balance. I remember the way in which Rachel sought not only tranquility, but also challenge through nature, as she plotted a course for a rigorous training program in preparation for a multi-week overland hiking and climbing trip last summer. I remembered Rachel's voice asking, do you want to go hiking? In a constant refrain outside my classroom that spring. Not because she needed others to propel her along, but because her inclination is always to include others on her best adventures. Rachel is an incredibly passionate person, but what's incredible is she seems the most passionate about supporting her friends, shared Emma Wine. She's always talking about other people's talents and figuring out fun ways to spend time together, and she's the first to make sure everyone feels included. I remembered after that summer, when Rachel's twin sister Claire characterized the Overland experience as something truly transformational for Rachel, a freedom that was not only energizing, but also empowering. She was able to prove her to herself that she is capable of more than she imagined, something I have always known about her, but that she had to learn for herself. I remembered the ways over the past four years in which Rachel seemed to take each new challenge in stride. She was such a determined student at every turn and never seemed to burn out or become jaded by the rhythms and demands of school. 
As teachers, we remember how Rachel always found a way to center personal connection and fun. Eulalia Ferrer praises Rachel's persistence and intellect, but most fondly remembers Rachel's presentation on how to pick locks in Spanish. And Dan, Jacob deli Dan Jacobs delights in the long discussions he, Rachel, and Julia DeGazio had during their independent study. I remember that despite having such a standout academic career, Rachel still named her best Roper memories as those spent with loved ones, the same piece she extracted from nature coming through in her friendships. I like to think about all the times I sat in the halls or the grass in front of the school and had meaningful discussions with my friends, she shared with me. We talked about such a variety of topics. I felt so close to them and we learned so much about each other. We helped each other grow and work through tough times. They were the times where I let go of my other worries. Within these remembrances, I found it hard not to be saddened with the knowledge that Rachel's time at Roper is concluded and she is heading to Knox College next year. But I'm heartened by the resolve Rachel has shown in these complicated times. In one of her last essays for Roper, Rachel reflected on the novel Station Eleven, which takes place in a post-pandemic society. Rather than cast one time period or the other as a perfect world, pre-pandemic or post-pandemic, the author shone a light on the beauty that is constant in both, the humanity of communities that people create, the drive humans have to feel connected to one another. Wendell Berry spoke a truth profoundly real for Rachel and for many of us, that a breath taken amongst the interdependence and simplicity of nature can be healing and uplifting. And for me, that same effect happens when I'm in Rachel's presence. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and I am free. I'm honored to present Roper graduate, Rachel Meyer Dietz. I met Emily four years ago. When she first entered the class and told me her name, I asked her, Emily, is Emily Dickinson? Emily broke into shy by broader smile that I vividly and lovingly remember today. Emily Carmanos is a passionate and creative writer and like her namesake, is reserved, intelligent, and a deep thinker. When you first met Emily, she's perceived as quiet, observing and analyzing everything. She's quiet, but not voiceless, and when was for a question she's always prepared with a great insight. Emily is most comfortable expressing herself through music, writing, and art. Creative writing is one of Emily's passions and she's been working diligently to develop her craft by studying at Oakland University and at the Interlochen Center of the Arts. Currently, she's working on her, her first novel. Her expository writing teacher called her Subdue Powerhouse of Writer. Her writing skills have been an outstanding asset for the yearbook as a four-year active member and one of the yearbook co-editors. Emily's wonderful pianism has been playing for 10 years and has received recognition through the competition she has entered. She can play by ear and compose in her head and she demonstrate, she, as she demonstrated in a piece she played for her senior project. The modern Emily loves video games and some of her original music has a strong video game influence. But she does more than play. She has taken many classes on video game design, animation, and drawing. Emily, te sugiero que hagas un videojuego para niños sobre tu perra Lily. I just suggested that she creates a video game for children about her dog Lily. Of course, Emily doesn't need a translation, as she speaks fluent Spanish, yet another skill she possesses. Emily loves peaceful and intimate spaces to meet with family and friends. A, fam a favorite place up north is a forest where she plays as a child. She loves going to Lily Tien with friends and at Rope where she, f she favors a small alcove where she eats lunch with friends. Emily's parents describe her as a kind and gentle soul with a quiet disposition, always listening and observing the world around her. Emily is compassionate and cares for people and loves animals. While the gentle demeanor is more prominent, she's also quite funny and has a quick wit. Emily's friend Rory concurs with her parents that Emily is an intelligent and talented writer, an empathetic person, and while others might not always perceive her wit, she possesses a great sense of humor. Emily has a quiet inner confidence and strength. She does not conform to other pressures. She will not do anything she does not want to do herself. I can personally attest to her sense of humor and inner confidence because being a brilliant writer, she has chosen me, her Spanish teacher, to give her senior speech. You can imagine my surprise. Te quiero, Emily. Emily, you have no difficulty communicating with your community through your acts of kindness, music, and writing. 
You are a good listener, super observant, and committed to learning. Creative minds like yours need a space to think and invent and new ideas and worlds. I cannot wait to read your novel or play a video game about Lily, all the while listening to your latest piano concerto. My best wishes to your new adventures at Kenyon College, where you will make great contributions, always with, with, with kindness, intelligence, and a touch of humor, your way. Dear Noah, when I began to compose the speech, I had a very difficult time trying to figure out how to frame what I wanted to express. I tried on various metaphors and I compiled a couple of anecdotes from your time at Roper, like the time I tried to teach you how to crochet. But in the end, what I really wanted to share in your senior speech was my immense gratitude for what you have shared with me during your time at Roper. In many ways, we've been on somewhat parallel journeys over the last three years. Plenty of ups and downs and serial tests of resilience and fortitude. I'd like you to know of the three really important reminders that you have provided for me as I look back. First off, you've reminded me of how important it is to delight and love and own the geek inside. Our first intellectual adventure brought us to the landscape of human emotions from a philosophical, cultural, and psychological point of view. Our discussions of Cicero gave me a chance to remember how much fun it is to spar philosophically about the things that make humans so strange and fascinating at the same time. It was like being back in graduate school. You have an uncanny ability to deconstruct concepts and also link them back to each other, but in novel ways. And I am grateful for the fact that I got to play in the intellectual sandbox with you. Secondly, you reminded me of the importance of investing in the moment. This past year, before we were exiled from school, you arranged to give a piano recital in the Commons. Now, for me, this would have been terrifying. I struggle with performance anxiety in a variety of ways, but to see you in the Commons was an incredibly valuable reminder of investing in the moment. You were actually kind of oblivious to all the other activity that was going on in the Commons, and you didn't seem bothered at all if people were listening intently or not, or if you made a mistake or not. It just seemed like fun for the sake of fun, and music for the sake of music. Recently, when I've become consumed by the complexity of a task, I take a moment to remember to invest in the here and now, and to be present in the same way that you showed me at that recital. Finally, and perhaps the most significant reminder has been, it's okay to be a red hot mess sometimes. We both know that the journey can get really bumpy, and there are times when everything seems to fall apart. The perseverance you have demonstrated and the inner strength that you have worked very hard to build have seen you through some rough waters. That's not to say it's all smooth sailing from here, but the persistence of your efforts to truly pursue what genuinely is self-actualization are admirable and provide me with the reminder that being vulnerable does not amount to weakness. Being vulnerable allows you to accept the guidance of others and to recover from the skids. We know that teachers learn a lot from their students, but as you embark on the next stage of education and life, I wanted to send this thank you that acknowledges the life lessons you have brought back into focus for me. Congratulations, Noah Sklar, Roper Class of 2020. You have made a lasting impact. I remember Max's visit to Roper in eighth grade, their eager excitement at the opportunity to learn and exchange ideas and be part of this community. Max made many friends here and quickly gained the admiration and affection of peers and staff with their openness and empathy, with their clever opinions and silly, relatable sense of humor. Even as a ninth grader in American Lit, Max was able to contribute deep insight being brave enough to share relevant personal stories, attempting to relate to characters, just as Max has put effort into knowing and caring for so many of us. Max's Grammy and Poppy extol Max as capable, interested in learning, but most importantly, a very good person. And they recall the pride Max took in making them scrumptious Sunday breakfasts. Gail Gorski observes, that people are drawn to Max's genuine acceptance and non-judgmental attitude. In numerous situations, Gail has witnessed Max stand up for what they believe while listening to and respecting every voice in the discussion. 
Max's father, Ron, admires how passionate Max is about issues of equity and justice, always looking for ways to help. This past Valentine's Day, Max used their artistic talent to create beautiful cards to spread awareness and benefit Australia's Wildlife Relief Fund. But it is Max's day-to-day -day kindness and thoughtfulness that sticks with family and friends. Max's Aunt Carol praised Max for learning early the important lesson that people and family are more important than things, and recalls a particular holiday when Max was 10, where Max commented that the carrot souffle was heaven in my mouth, and then thanked her earnestly for dinner. Max always exhibits gratefulness for the opportunities they have and the feedback they're given. And I love this story because after four different creative writing courses, I know how masterfully Max wields imagery and figurative language. Their writing has grown richer over the years, and Max has breathed life into many memorable characters. Bumpkin, need I say more. Anyone who has shared one of these classes and workshopped with Max has felt supported by them. Max is appreciative and gives credit to others, and Max's suggestions and feedback are delivered gently and in the earnest spirit of helpfulness. Next year, Max will continue to develop their talent and creativity at the College for Creative Studies. Janet Zito commented, What I always appreciated about Max is their readiness to talk about the work, the process, and the thinking happening as they planned and options. This is such an important part of being an artist, specifically an artist who can sustain their own motivations to create, to continually learn about art and how art affects others. Max, you are sensitive, kind, humble, loyal, an artist, a poet, a builder of worlds, the deity of snack. You care for our hearts and we thank you. In your words, from your poetry collection junior year, the light remembers each cheek you've grazed with your hand, each shard of glass you've broken underfoot. As you grasp the palms of what you once were and what has not yet come to pass, know that we walk with you and love you. It is my honor to present Roper graduate, Max Yolis. I have watched Jaden grow a great deal during his time in the Ever School. I first met him when he took my Physics of the Everyday World class as a sophomore. He was a brilliant student and very capable, but also very easily distracted. When I had him again his senior year, he was so much more mature, I was barely able to recognize him. He had blossomed into a focused and dedicated student who seemed truly engaged in learning. I got to see him in my astronomy and electronics classes where he was one of the best in both classes. I especially enjoyed having him in my electronics elective where he had a lot of good insight based on what he already knew and seemed genuinely interested in learning more. He would often ask questions about pushing things to the limit, how much current would make a circuit component explode, things like that. But I can tell that he was seriously interested in understanding the limitations of the equipment, and even though his sense of humor could be a little, shall we say, uh, tilted, he was clearly thinking deeply about how to get things to do what he wanted. I'm not the only one who noticed his interest picking up a great deal as he got older. Michelle Stamler says that in his senior year, Jaden got very interested in photography. As this commitment manifested itself into what had been an adventurous and complicated independent study for second semester. Unfortunately, the virus put an end to it, but it was an impressive undertaking. Max Collins also pointed out some developments over the last year. He said Jaden was consistently pleasant and friendly with all the younger children uh, whenever we did bonding sessions with either middle or lower school kids. He proved to be a pretty good dodgeball player during several homeroom tournaments and connected with Max's military knowledge by showing a video of his shooting a Thompson machine gun, submachine gun, excuse me. He loves boating and snowboarding, and on at least one occasion, he got to go to Vail to do it. His uncle Jimmy also had a lot to say about him. When Jaden was little, he was an incredibly inquisitive little man. He wanted to know everything about anything. The questions can go on for hours, but he would listen thoughtfully to the answers. As he grew older, the questions became practical, and now Jaden's questions are complex based on his own thoughtful interpretation of the world around him. He is smart, kind, funny, and has an amazing work ethic. He's a bold sportsman, extremely patriotic, and a wonderful and sensitive son. 
I have so much respect and pride for the outstanding person Jaden has become, and this is just the beginning. Jaden will be attending Michigan Tech next year, and we're all looking forward to hearing how he does on his next big project. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present Roper alum Jaden Bayer. How does a 12-year-old develop an evolved sense of fairness and empathy, showing a maturity far beyond his years? Well, if you need a prototype, look no further than Jackson Campbell. If Jackson's empathy and sense of fairness culminated in his government practical at the VFW, Matt Vallis noting that the experience brought Jackson closer to understanding the impact that war can have on people and how we need to take care of these individuals. Did it begin years before when Jackson's family hosted orphans for a few weeks at a time during summer and holiday breaks? The organization Frontier Horizon places orphans from Ukraine, Nicaragua, or Kyrgyzstan in the USA, allowing them to experience life in a loving and caring home. Jackson began his Roper career in the eighth grade and immediately made his mark, dubbed a wise man, man in the teenager's body by Karen Johnson, Jackson says, I really have been exposed to a lot of ideas that I wouldn't have been otherwise. Everybody has something interesting to talk about. Jackson's mother thinks Roper's value manifests itself in the experience of being with people who are extremely different than you. Jackson's grandmother suggested Roper, thank you, and his grandfather told me that while they have explored the world together, their dearest memories are listening to what's on Jackson's mind over a cup of Starbucks coffee. Friend Caleb is impressed by Jackson's extreme awareness of the world around him and his philosophy of positivity and empathy. And Chris Ban laments not getting to know Jackson earlier on in high school. When I asked Jackson about his favorite teachers and classes, Jackson said, I don't think I've ever had a negative experience with a teacher. More accurately, I don't think I've ever got a talking to that I didn't deserve. Impressing the faculty en masse might surprise Jackson were he to reread his grade reports. It is not that Jackson hides his light under a bushel, rather that Jackson is unaware of his light and how brightly it shines. My colleagues reference Jackson's maturity, his penchant for deep thought, his unique respect of others possessing a great attitude, quick-witted, commanding a wry and dry sense of humor, mastering irony, a clever person who is open and unassuming. Jackson can work with everyone and treat all with respect. A talent for analysis and a flair for written and verbal expression, says Max. An amazing mind for physics, says Andrew. A phenomenal human being, so insightful and interesting, says Kelly Piantek. Teaching Jackson was a delight, as was our time in Emoja. Jackson was a rudder of this diversity group and approached all aspects of it with a dedication and enthusiasm. Jackson was effusive and thrilled when he attended a diversity workshop with students from other independent schools. He had found his niche. Jackson will attend Michigan State University in the fall to study what? Teaching? Maybe not. Jackson said, I think perhaps the biggest thing I've learned from Roper is how difficult it is to be a teacher. I very, I very seriously considered a trajectory that would have kept me in academia but having seen some of what that would entail has changed the way I think about the entire rest of my life. In a ceramic self-evaluation, Jackson wrote, to make art is to be human. A world without art isn't worth living in. I contend that a world without Jackson Campbell is not worth living in. It is with great enthusiasm and deep affection that I present to you Roper graduate, Jackson Campbell. When she was little, Alexa Miller would often cajole her younger sister, Elise, into playing school. Every day would be the first day of school, Elise remembers. We split the dolls up and we would have an assembly line to get them dressed and make sure everyone had an outfit and a backpack. Alexa always wanted the first day to be perfect. Flash forward to Alexa's senior year and on the first day of school, she was not only preparing to tackle a daunting course load in college applications, but also to teach a class of her own. 
As a sophomore, Alexa saw the desire in her peers to tackle real world issues and the need for authentic connections between middle and upper school students and she decided to make something happen. She made it her mission to teach a class in identity and diversity for her senior project. Her class was incredibly successful, in no small part because she exuded humility, kindness, and grace, essential components of being a leader in social justice work. Erin Robinson describes Alexa's thoughtfulness. She has a way of absorbing everything that goes on, reflecting on it, and then coming back a day or two later with an excellent question that can start an entirely new conversation. Alexa endeavored to be sure that everything would be as perfect as it could be. For a year and a half before that first day of class, she conducted research, shadowed experts, previewed her activities for friends and family members, and while she may not have been able to furnish each of her students with an outfit and backpack, she arrived to class each day with a minute-by-minute -minute lesson plan. That determination manifests in all areas of Alexa's life. I didn't know her when she was engaged in gymnastics, her first serious love, but when she wrote an essay for expository writing about how the sport taught her to evaluate her strengths and weaknesses, relentlessly practice, and delight in seeing calluses form on her palms, I recognize the young woman I admire today. Whenever something is daunting for Alexa, in school, life, or sports, she never gives up. Jamie Benigna captures Alexa's positive work ethic. Although the work was hard, Alexa appreciated learning, even when she was simultaneously disparaging and embracing the challenge. Alexa does not back down when work is hard. She digs in, works harder, tries different strategies, and builds on what works. She celebrates the small victories and uses them to build momentum to tackle the more difficult ones ahead. Such an industrious approach to life might turn someone into an achievement drone, but another element of Alexa's success is that she has grown to trust her instincts instead of a checklist. She's almost reflexively become a leader among her peers, someone who has earned their admiration without ever even asking for it. When her volleyball teammates are down and frustrated in a game, Alexa helps them find their center. And when friends need perspective and advice, they trust Alexa's counsel. It doesn't matter what you're talking about, but if you're talking to Alexa about it, it feels important because you can tell she's listening to what you're saying, shares friend and teammate Sydney Levy. The way she's been a dear sister to not only Elise, but also exchange student Callie and the 21 babies her family has fostered as she's grown up has extended to her friends as well. Kate Gironi shares, her soft-spoken heart-to-hearts with me have taught me many things. She can always listen to anything I say and give perfect advice, leading me onto a good path. She has done this for almost everyone she meets. In reflecting on her time at Roper, Alexa shares that Roper pushed me to find my passion and my voice. As she heads to the University of Pittsburgh to pursue chemistry, I know she'll have the perfect outfit and backpack picked out for her first day in the lab, but I also know that her self-awareness, confidence, and diligent pursuit of excellence will be the essential components of her success. It is my honor to present Roper graduate Alexa Beatrice Miller. I want every girl in the world to pick up a guitar and start screaming. These are the words of Courtney Love at the height of grunge rock stardom. Courtney was bold, fearless, uncompromising, nonconformist, an icon of the feminist youth movement of Generation X. But she was also controversial and polarizing as she openly mocked institutions and notions of femininity and beauty. For her AP English research paper, Kayla Park took on the subject of grunge and gender. I can't even describe how much this appealed to my former 90s Gen Xer self. I could barely contain my smug slacker satisfaction. In my earlier days, I too discovered Courtney and was drawn to her brash refusal to bend to the rules of aesthetics, politics, and social norms. Kayla and I share an appreciation of the nonconformists, those who struggle and rage, those who do not fit in, the outcasts, the rebels, those who engage with the world passionately and brazenly. In other words, those who produce the best art. Kayla's project served as the dissonant crescendo of our studies and talks over the years, which have revealed to me her power and potential. With a razor sharp analytical mind and a punk rock sensibility, Kayla has the ability to see the beauty in what the world calls ugly, to find logic in the illogical, and to see straight into the institutions of power and the mechanisms of social norms. She has no problem being honest, even when it's difficult 
harsh, or brutal. This comes through in everything she does, her academic work, her passion for social justice, and her personal and social life. It has allowed her to develop a remarkable sense of self-possession. She is more comfortable in her own skin than the vast majority of adults I know, even my Gen X peers who conjured Courtney Love into being in the first place. Kayla has achieved a level of maturity and authenticity that allows her to connect with people on a deeply honest human level. In fact, she's taught me a thing or two about the value of asking ourselves the difficult questions, holding ourselves accountable, and being willing to do the work, not just when it comes easy, but also when it challenges us, destabilizes us, or rocks our world. This is the work of the artists we've discussed together, Baudelaire, Kubrick, Courtney Love, the truth tellers and seekers, the unafraid and unintimidated, much like you. While I will miss these daily discussions very much, I'm thrilled to know that you will carry on this work and continue to blaze your own brilliant trail at Purdue University and beyond. Congratulations, Kayla Park. It was our end of the year Kensington outing 2018. I had some anxiety about my ability as homeroom teacher to pull off lunch for our homeroom. Chandler Thomas, then a sophomore, had been a great asset to our homeroom and to me personally all year. Whenever we needed something done, Chandler was the first to volunteer. In this case, true to form, he assured me that he would help me at the grill. In fact, being a fairly skilled griller, he offered to take care of it for me completely. But then he suffered a back injury and even though he had soldiered on and made it through finals, never one to ask for extensions or special considerations, it was not without challenge. On the morning of Kensington, as we met to board the bus for the park, I realized that Chandler was absent. My first concern was his well-being. Once it was clear that he was okay, my second was, how am I going to pull this off? By the time we arrived at the park, I had resigned myself to my arduous task. It was as we were setting up that I saw Chandler walking towards us through the park. When he reached us, he said, I promised to help you and I know you were counting on me, so I'm here. This is Chandler. This act, showing up even when it was not easy, is one which speaks volumes of his character. Chandler will not let you down. You can count on it and you can count on him. I've had the pleasure of becoming acquainted with Chandler's family, not only as his teacher, but also because my son and his younger brother are classmates. In fact, I first met his mother in this environment as fellow Roper parents. I liked Petra right, right away and could tell that we were simpatico. Later, when I got to know Chandler, his demeanor and work ethic made perfect sense. I knew that Petra placed a high value on ethics and quite simply raising good children who were responsible and respectful and worked hard and helped others. I've asked Petra more than once if she would be kind enough to let me in on her secret. I'm still hoping for that tutoring session. Chandler, I hope you know that I've had your back throughout <clears throat> our years together, but here's the secret. I've always felt that you've had mine too. This is loyalty. It's how it works. It's a two-way street and you get what you give. When I think of you, loyalty is the first word to come to mind. Loyalty to your family, your friends, your community, and yourself. Life is complicated, but also kind of simple. And that's what it's about. The relationships we form, the bonds we share, and the ways in which we show up for the people we care about. It's about loyalty, and you have it in spades. While I will miss you very much, it warms my heart to imagine you out in the world, working hard, helping those in need, and being a loyal friend to all. Congratulations, Chandler Thomas. Wayne State University is fortunate to have you.
Hello, Roper. Thank you for being present to our virtual uh, senior speeches and graduation. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the one and only, truly one and only Medina Garvin's graduation from Roper. The most important thing to know about Medina is that she is her own person. This is not to say that she is intentionally willful or will not do what needs to get done. This is to say that she is her own person and it's essential to know that she needs to understand the why of it all. When Medina came to Roper as an eighth grade student, I'd like to say that she landed on campus with a splash that would grossly understate the impact she's had on our community. She was and is bright-eyed, courageous, gritty, and has a BS meter that is incredibly accurate. Medina jumped into sports playing basketball and volleyball, and although injuring her ACL sidelined her for a minute in, as a sophomore, it's significant to note that this did not stop her from supporting her friends at their games. Medina could have shrunk into the frustrations from this injury, but as Susanna mentions, what I've come to admire about Ms. Medina is her resilience. That's an overused word these days, but it seems to ring true for her. She's faced a lot of challenges and could have given up both in classes and as a, in her personal life, but she endured. She finds a way to keep going. Max Collins offers this perspective. I describe her as serious, polite, and I think she's pretty ambitious in her plans for her future. Matt Vallis shared that Medina is one of the reasons why I enjoy teaching this class. It's because I get to see all of the students I taught way back when they were ninth graders. And most importantly, I get to witness the growth that they have over the years. And for you, Medina, I have to say, I'm so proud of you. There are, There is no doubt that Medina was well liked by her teachers. There are a number of adjectives that have appeared in her reports over the years, such as confident, insightful, perceptive, and one that was most mentioned by several teachers, organized. Not just organized, but extremely organized. And this, it's her desire for organization that has helped her be successful in a lot of her classes, namely with Hale, Brian Hewitt, and Emily Rowland. This year has been a challenging one for Medina on a lot of fronts. With that same energy and commitment that she used to muster through her ACL injury, she championed herself to keep her eyes and spirit focused on healing and staying healthy. I've come to love the boundary testing, relationship testing, and the tests that Medina puts herself through. To know Medina's edgy side is to love her. Jeff, you mentioned in a note about Medina that I've been here to help her on her roller coaster ride at Roper uh, and that you're grateful. But I have to say a heartfelt thank you to you and Sharon for entrusting Medina's social emotional care for, to us at Roper. As she embarks on her new journey to become a Baylor Bear in the fall, I'd like us to say a rousing hell yeah to Roper's newest alum, Medina Garvin. Congratulations. One of the values Roper often espouses is finding and being yourself. This is a monumental task for a high schooler. With all the social and cultural pressures pushing us past our breaking points and molding us into preset images. Celia is a paragon of the bravery and strength it takes to stay true to one's own image of themselves. When we look back on our high school experience, Comparing ourselves to the past, we do not focus on the grades, but what the work meant to us. Seeing Celia put in the work to learning about white supremacy and civil rights was eclipsed only by the love I saw poured into the final project on tackling and remedying systemic injustice. When we look back, we do not focus on lectures, but what those teachers meant to us. Celia has had a role model and friend in Susanna Nichols, who taught Celia the subtle arts of analysis and indispensable skills of critique. More than that, Susanna gave Celia a place to be, unapologetically and incensurably Celia. It comes as a surprise to some people in the world that teachers and students can have strong connections, but here, the surprise only comes in the heights to which it propels us both. When we look back, we think not of only tears, but of laughs 
and smiles. I would lose count if I tried to calculate the cackles and giggles, the jokes and puns, the one-liners and retorts coming from Celia and the gang right outside my door. And inside, the sum of all that life had to throw at Celia came tumbling out on the table between us as words wrestled with existence. Those conversations allowed me a glimpse into the life of someone extraordinary. Celia is the type of person you find when you look into the heart of who you could be. Someone strong, someone authentic, someone resilient, and someone who finds fulfillment in the way they lead their life. Despite thoughts to the contrary, Celia, your time with Roper is not over yet. You have left a legacy in the people who know you here. And here, your mark is stained into the core of what it means to strive to be Roperian. The philosophy is alive in you. Kate Deroni is a boss. From the classroom to the editing room, Kate knows how to take charge and get things done. Linda Vernon put it best when she said, don't get in this young woman's way, she is on a mission. Advancing through the science program at Roper as quickly as she could, Kate drew Jamie Benigna's admirations with her proactive approach, speaking up when she needed help even though she was the youngest in the class. Kate also climbed the ladder in yearbook, serving as editor in her senior year. Facing perhaps the most challenging setting any editor has faced to date, Kate worked against the odds of a pandemic and distance learning to provide something special and nostalgic to the student body. Although many students have big dreams, Kate really knows how to turn dreams into reality. Susanna Nichols noted that Kate wanted to join a community service club as a wide-eyed freshman but realized the club didn't already exist. If she wanted to be part of the club, she'd have to establish it herself. As the club's advisor, Susanna summed it up. Kate has the ability to see what she wants and go for it. And with much thought and organization, the community service club was a success. Kate didn't stop there. She expanded her knowledge volunteering with Summer in the City in Detroit and worked to create a sustainable community service learning model for Roper as a school. Annalise Ingraham was in awe of her friend saying, Kate is passionate, intense, smart, thoughtful, and feisty. I have always admired how much she knows what she wants. That is perhaps the most surprising thing about Kate. She can sometimes be anxious or unsure of how to proceed, seeking advice from trusted loved ones, but ultimately she knows just what to do. Linda went on saying, Kate knows her own mind. Balancing a healthy dose of self-awareness and self-confidence, Kate has truly grown to understand herself. This has, led her, this has led to her exploration of her creative side, practicing photography, sewing, and her infamous bullet journals, as well as the development of her scientific mind. This year, Kate presented a senior project where she designed, formulated, and created her own brand of face masks in the perfect combination of her love for science and all things creative. She had been inspired as a sixth grader by a Roper senior, Marie Carosa, who had made and sold lipsticks for her project. In true Kate spirit, she started planning her senior project years in advance and formed the connections and support system to make it happen. This project did not only highlight Kate's advanced skill and remarkable determination. This project provided yet another moment where Kate was able to acknowledge people who have inspired her, guided her, and supported her in her journey, and pay homage to them, something that Kate frequently makes an effort to do. Despite all of her planning for this project and the countless other amazing achievements she has had at Roper, she may not have been able to plan or predict her lasting legacy at the school. She has set an incredible example for younger students who have looked up to her, accomplishing new feats while maintaining a strong character. Alexa Miller described Kate as honest and fiercely loyal, as well as one of, as well as one of the most empathetic and forgiving people she has ever met. Combined with her extreme talent and overflowing list of accomplishments, Kate has solidified her standing as a leader in the school and paved the way for younger students to follow her example for years to come. This fall, Kate will study cosmetic science and formulation design in the College of Pharmacy at University of Toledo. Toledo has no idea how lucky they are to have our number one boss. I'm so honored to present to you Roper graduate, Katherine Emma Deroni. I've known Jimmy Giftos since he was in my homeroom in history class in eighth grade. He's a very positive young man. 
who can be described in four ways. Family, funny, friendly, and focused. I came to know Jimmy increasingly well in homeroom, in class, and later in Bali UM. We, we fully bonded over our love of English soccer, each following our favorite but different clubs, with Jimmy's team in the ascendancy. I recall stage three visiting the Birmingham campus and was impressed with Jimmy's kindness to his younger sister, Andy. When they saw each other, Jimmy gave Andy a big hug, kiss on the cheek, and introduced her to his homeroom friends and teacher. Matt Vallis wrote, during Model UN, his brother Pete was having a rough go, maybe a little homesick. I was impressed, but not surprised, that Jimmy was by his side, supporting Pete the best he could. At Model UN in Amsterdam, Jim met with his father and two adult cousins from Greece. He did his best communicating with his cousin, who spoke little English. Jim's desire to speak may have motivated his study of Greek as a senior. Classicist Karen Johnson wrote, I hope you have the chance to continue your studies in modern Greek and will experience the joy of communication with people in your non-native language. Jimmy is the embodiment of friendly, and his fellowship has few bonds. In class, in the commons, and on trips, he's in the middle of things, but always noticing if another student needs attention. He's an outstanding group mem member, whether social, academic, or extracurricular. In biology, Laura Panic wrote, I've been impressed by how you treat your peers and support others when we worked in groups. You are modest, and this makes you an excellent group partner. Other upper school teachers noted, you have a great sweet nature. Greets the class with a smile and great attitude, and is respectful of every, everyone. Jimmy embodied his quiet leadership and kindness as a big brother in a 2018 cross-school project. David Feldman wrote, Jimmy provided strong leadership in the stage four voting rights simulation. He was able to guide his younger peers to a deeper understanding of voting rights and voter suppression. Linda Vernon, Jimmy's upper school homeroom teacher, wrote her favorite Jimmy memory from every year during the holidays at campus marshes. Jimmy would get out there on the rink, big smile on his face, and demonstrate some pretty amazing skating skills. Equally as impressive, he spent a great deal of time and effort cheerfully assisting those who were more challenged when it came to staying upright on the ice. Model UN advisor Matt Vallis affirmed, if I had to emphasize Jimmy's most visible trait, it would be his kindness, relentless positivity. Jimmy is one of the nicest kids I've ever been around in my years at Rome. He will always reach out to see how you're doing, and always has everyone's back. Jimmy can be very funny when the time is right, or sometimes, as his dad said, is a mischievous instigator. In Model UN, he was likely to point out delegates' inconsistencies in policy between sessions, often when another nation's delegate reversed their position. Kelly Piantic wrote in English 9, Jim created character, developed the voice of Nikhilis Dilma in an autobiography that was engaging, funny, and clearly articulated. Imagine someone as boneheaded as Nikhilis winning a lot and then promptly losing the ticket. I laughed so hard it hurt a little. Emily Rowland noted in Advanced Biology, the class enjoyed your osmosis story about a short-lived goldfish. It was a great way to remember osmosis and how not to raise a fish. And this year, in environmental science, Emily wrote of Jimmy, as you brought both joy and laughter, I found your presence to be more of a wise sage. You were also a high achiever with a sense of humor and would always try to tell a joke to lighten the mood. Jimmy is focused. While he had significant challenges with his health, he was prepared to catch up and complete work with his efforts lauded by his teachers. Each year his work became more challenging. Jim continued to rise to the occasion. In his freshman year, Matt Vallis said, how much I appreciate your ability to follow up after being out of school for a designated time. In 10th grade, Latin teacher Natalie Abbott wrote, Jimmy is a very mature and responsible young man. He works hard and is polite and courteous. Western literature teacher Susanna Nichols said that Jim 
participated in discussions and small work with enthusiasm and understanding. In his junior year, Jimmy made strides in many areas. He was one of nine students to travel to Holland in October for Lawrence Montaguen, representing Luxembourg in the environmental program, and made side trips to study Holland's water management systems. Jim's dad, Tom, wrote, he loved the camaraderie and independence. Of course, meeting his Greek relatives for the first time was a thrill for him. David Feldman noted that in American government, as the only member of our class eligible to vote in the 2018 election, Jim was able to share firsthand insight into the experience and how we prepared to participate in the election. Expository writing teacher Susanna Nichols stated, your decision to submit your essay and your experience with your long-term illness to your peers for review was a brave choice. I know you were conscious of how to walk a line between being real and honest. AP English teacher Kelly McDowell spoke for all of Jimmy's teachers at Roper's 2020 Asphalt Auditorium graduation. Bravo, Jimmy. I'm beyond proud of you. Thank you for sticking with it during this highly unusual, challenging time. I hope you feel proud of all your efforts in AP English. You submitted every ass assignment and approached the process with a great attitude and lots of positivity. Jimmy, best wishes in your future studies at the University of Denver. It has been a real joy for your friends, your family, and your teachers to see your growth, your health, and your accomplishments. Ladies and gentlemen, Jimmy Giftings. My sister has told me often over the years that she disliked being introduced as Kelly's little sister. She felt that it negated her identity and individuality. We all know just how different and unique siblings can be despite being raised in the same family. My sister and I are no exception and I would say that the same goes for Annalise Ivanescu and her sister Isabel. While I was introduced to her as my talented student Isabel's little sister, it took me no time at all to realize the uniqueness of Annalise. Annalise is witty and fun, strong and independent, and an intellectual powerhouse. The first time that I had the pleasure of having her in a class was during a special topics elective that I taught in 2016. It was called Americans in Paris, and we explored the work of the lost generation expats during the interwar modernist period of artistic and cultural profusion. The class marked one of those special situations at Roper, when the stars line up just so, and it feels like we are fueled by kismet. We had a fantastic little group, and we created our own little salon in the classroom, where we discussed aesthetics, culture, and politics in a relaxed conversational atmosphere. Sometimes I brought croissants. I knew this was going to be an unusual class and I was grateful that this group of students happily jumped on board. Annalise was the happiest of jumpers. She was the only freshman in a class of juniors and seniors. With, an, with exuberance and an open mind, Annalise kept pace with students a few year, years older. Her level of maturity allowed her to fit in seamlessly and her ambitious spirit and sharp intellect impressed her peers. She earned their respect and they treated her as an equal in all regards. She was a leading voice in, the class, in a classroom full of sophisticated academic discourse and her contributions were sharp, insightful and important. Once again, entering into a situation where she was marked younger Annalise demonstrated her ability to meet every challenge with a skill set and philosophical mind well beyond her years. Since then, I have had the pleasure of serving as Annalise's homeroom advisor as well as her AP English teacher. During this time, I've come to know many endearing aspects of Annalise's character. She is warm, caring, generous, and sharply funny. She appreciates satire and sa sarcasm, and she can take a joke. She is tough, she is stoic, she is a force. Congratulations, Annalise Ivanescu, and get ready, St. John's College, for this remarkable student with a style all her own and a lot to say on her own terms and from a deep sense of who she is.
That, Caleb Bardis. Caleb Bardis arrived on the scene in my seventh grade English class seemingly as a fully formed adult. Now we all know that precocity is a hallmark of gifted students, but with Caleb, things were always on another level. Caleb excelled in my class, but this was only a starting point for a relationship that would continue to develop over the next five years. Caleb is all about the authentic, the interpersonal, the real. His engagement is never one-dimensional, shallow, or superficial. When Caleb invests in something, whether that something is a project or a person, Caleb goes all in. Caleb is both a man of ideas and a man of the people. And where those two passions meet is where you will find him at his greatest. Caleb Bardis is a doer. As Chris Band points out, some people do things because they have to or because they want to. But Caleb often does things simply because he can. Whether it is building a treehouse, stringing a hammock in his bedroom, or refurbishing an old accordion, Caleb always has at least one project going. And as Jackson Campbell notes, for every project you see in process, Caleb has at least one more cooking on the back burner. Caleb is a true tinkerer, ready to jump in and get his hands dirty as part of any new adventure. Like Chris says, sometimes Caleb does things just to kind of see what happens. Caleb learns best through experience and action, and he is always excited by any opportunity to bring others along for the ride. Caleb thrives in constructivist settings, whether engaging in a classroom discussion on political philosophy, serving as a delegate at a Model United Nations summit, or recording an experimental album in the trunk of his car, 
Caleb is at his best when he can combine his creative energies and critical insights with those of other high-powered individuals. In many cases, I think the particular mode and output of collaboration matters less to Caleb than the process itself. The man just wants to be involved. But that isn't quite right, because Caleb wants more than to be simply involved. Caleb also wants to improve, to elevate, to transform. He wants to help raise discussions to the next level. He wants to help people move from points A, B, to points C, D, E, and beyond. Caleb wants to immerse himself in the discourse, looking and listening for what is missing, for those ideas which are being overlooked. So what now for Caleb Bardis? Well, in the fall, he will hopefully be off to Washington, D.C., ready to simultaneously immerse himself in both the academic and political scenes. But whenever Caleb gets out there, a White House internship will be firmly fixed on his horizon. But until then, you can find Caleb holding caliber at his latest community project, a nightly musical bonfire around which all are welcome to share, discuss, debate, and enjoy some good times. Frankly, it doesn't get much more Caleb artist than May 2067. Fellow colleagues, we are gathered to wish a happy retirement to our colleague here at Yale University, Professor Blaise Carter. Blaise graduated from the Roper School in 2020 and later earned a PhD in literature, then accepted an assistant professorship at Harvard. At Harvard, Blaise generated path-breaking reinterpretations of Shakespeare's sonnets and became prominent in conservative political circles. Easily winning tenure, Blaise seemed destined for a long stay. Such was not to be. Blaise decided to merge his literary and political interests and shifted his scholarly focus. The result was, of course, feline canine, Blaise's reinterpretation of the American literary canon from a gender studies perspective that sought to revitalize traditional concepts of masculinity and feminine. Feline canine proved controversial, though the book was characterized by the good humor and fair-mindedness we all admire in ways. Debate about it proved heated, with opponents hurling invectives like furball, twit, and weasel at one another. Perhaps because of such uncivil displays, Blaze chose to resign his position. Although rumors have it that he was pressured to leave for wearing gym shorts to Harvard's formal dinner honoring Nobel laureates. Among friends, Blaze's resignation provoked worries about his finances, but they proved groundless. It was well known that feline canine was inspired by Blaze's relationship with his two tabby cats. But what was not known was that Blaze had been working on an entirely separate cat-related project. Based on cat disciplining skills acquired during high school, Blaze published Beyond Catnip, A Guide to Living with Cats, a New York Times bestseller for 16 weeks. Royalties from the book proved substantial, and then Blaze developed a line of Beyond Catnip products. It turned into an Inc. 5000 company he sold to Rockwell International Corporation for an undisclosed sum. Impressed by Blaze's business success, in 2052, the School of Management here at Yale offered him the Meow Mix Chair in Entrepreneurial Studies. Blaze accepted and settled into life at Yale. His courses proved popular and he generated a series of well-regarded publications on corporate growth. But drama returned to Blaze's career in 2054, when animal rights extremists, protesting Yale's treatment of lab rats, kidnapped the Yale bulldog, Handsome Dan. Yale will be forever in Blaze's debt as he drew on his credibility as an opponent of catnip abuse to win the trust of the kidnappers 
and negotiate a handsome Dan's release in time to appear at the Harvard-Yale football game. In addition to work at Yale, Blaze authored a conservative newspaper column, then later ran for Congress as the Republican candidate. However, he lost the election. Pundits opined that Blaze was simply too nice to be taken seriously as a politician, although there was also talk that he alienated voters by wearing gym shorts to a formal dinner honoring Connecticut Olympic athletes. For the next half decade, Blaze continued his teaching and research, but this year is his last year at Yale. We thank Blaze for his service. In the fantasy card game Magic the Gathering, a card called the Crude Rampart states, success is one part inspiration, nine parts desperation. This could well be Josh Stiebel's mantra slash flavor text. One consistent theme across eight years of reports stretching back to stage four is that Josh might fall down six times, but he gets up seven. And then he falls back down again, and he gets back up again, and so on. Now, some of this can be attributed to a quality that his friends describe in the nomenclature of behavioral science as being a goofball. Avery Long says that Josh is always up for having fun and that, for instance, Josh may or may not have tied the dolly to the back of their robot and drove himself around the school. Some of this is no doubt rooted in perfectionism. Josh wants to get it right, even when he's not sure what right is or what it is for that matter. But there's more to Josh's tumble through the world than perfectionism, since the word dedicated comes up from just about everyone who knows him. Avery points out that when the robotics team desperately needed something built or wired or anything to be done, Josh would work through the night on it. Josh is the king of waffling. Michelle Stamler pointed out that trusting himself is a leap of faith. But there's even more to it than that. As Jan Janet Zito stated, he is uncommonly creative. I have not met many students who demonstrate his ability to imagine various possibilities and to stretch and explore options. What Janet didn't realize is that Josh's alternate dimension project wasn't a mere flight of fancy. It was pretty much a description of his reality. He is a jack of all possible timelines and a master of none, able to render even time itself impotent and meaningless. But as Avery says, when Josh decides he really likes something, he really does it. It's just a matter of him figuring out what he really wants to do. Ultimately, all possible timelines lead to one conclusion. Josh is a really good friend. As Avery said, there would be times when it would be just the two of us after a tournament and we would just talk about life. And alum Josh Osgood said that Josh Stiebel likes sitting down together with people and just being together. Like the glow cloud that wreaked havoc on the town of Nightvale in the piece Josh performed in forensics in eighth grade, Josh is humming off to new distant destinations. The glow cloud moves on, and you move on, and you are left with a powerful wonder at the fleeting nature of even the most important things in life. Josh is now poised to play his end of the world card, which will transport him to the end of the world, also known as Houghton, Michigan, where he will study computer engineering at Michigan Tech, which has its own expansion deck that takes four to five years to play. Josh, you clearly have the skills and cards to win this game. Play well. Graduate Ben Stefile. Hey buddy, what are you doing? Those are the first words I can remember saying to Ben. He was lost, not figuratively lost, but actually lost. It was our, the first hour of our overnight basketball camp on a college campus. I had just given everyone strict instructions to walk in groups of three and sent the kids from their dorms to their first game. After everyone was gone, I noticed a phone laying on the ground where they had been sitting. I grabbed the phone and went to my car and to drive to our game, and there Ben was, standing in the middle of the road all by himself. Ben being lost that day gave us the opportunity to have our first real conversation. By the time he finished talking, uh, I had given him his phone, uh, which he had left in the hallway, and had driven him to his first game. When it was happening, 
I thought <clears throat> he was just a kid who got lost and by happenstance I had come across him. But knowing Ben the way I do now, I think it was his first power move, his first display of dominance in high school. How many freshmen have I personally chauffeured to their first high school basketball game? Just one. His name is Benjamin Callison Stefile. Reviewing this event in my mind four years later, I can easily see him saying something like this to his friends when they asked why he rode with me. I made Laddie drive because I didn't want to walk. Too bad you aren't awesome or he would have driven you too. Ben wasn't even on my team yet and I was already doing things for him. So many of my favorite memories from basketball include Ben in some way. His opinions on life and sports are intelligent, insightful, funny, and one of a kind. As a freshman, I asked Ben and Justin Acasian to film our Allen Park Cabrini basketball game. <clears throat> Their conversation was recorded and the commentary was hilarious. A day later as I watched the film, I found myself focusing more on what they were saying than the actual game. When you are first introduced to Ben's sarcasm and quick wit, it catches you off guard. I know it did for me. During basketball, Ben's zingers usually came when the room was quiet and at the expense of Evan Acasian. Ben is smart and creative with his deliveries, and the only thing better than hearing what is on his mind is when Ryan Zinzer and I would try to guess what Ben and his good friend Gianni Miotto talked about when they were out of earshot in the gym. <laughs> The possibilities were endless, and we never guessed what they were talking about. Having the chance to spend the last few years with Ben has been truly wonderful. He has been such a great part of my Roper experience, and some of my favorite moments of Ben include watching him play at the top of the 131 press and pretty much winning our game at Lutheran Westland his junior year listening to him talk about how much he hates all the teams in our league before we play them. Seeing the little smile he would get when he made a tough shot or did the finger wag after blocking someone's shot in a game. And then knowing how much he enjoyed hosting team practices at his dad's house. I will miss Ben greatly, but I know he will love his college experience. I fully expect him to come back to Roper and tell me <clears throat> all about his new friends and great new adventures. I also expect Ben uh, to have the dean, Mar the dean of Landmark College doing him favors within the first few hours he's on campus. So if you're at Landmark on the first day of school and you see Ben and the dean driving down the street together and wonder why, <laughs> it's because Ben is awesome and he didn't want to walk to his first class. Good luck, Ben. We're going to miss you. How to begin a speech about Tristan Wilson. He is a friend, a brother, a violinist, violist, composer, avid sheet music collector, a gamer, and a cook. There are so many aspects to Tristan and to distill them into a three minute speech is near impossible. But we'll start with music. Tristan lives music and he has for his entire life. Tristan's mother, Carrie, recalls how a young four-year-old Tristan gifted his preschool teacher, Miss Kim, a handwritten in marker one-page symphony he, could, he had composed. In third grade, while taking lessons from his instructor, John Trains, Tristan was asked how he makes music from what he sees on the page. To this, Tristan replied, I hear the music in my head when I look at the page. And it was then that John knew he had something special in this student and a sticky note that read, with practice you will become truly great, made its way into Tristan's practice notebook. Anyone who has met Tristan knows that he's a steady, stoic, and mature individual. I met him as he was entering seventh grade, and even during those formative years, typically characterized by spontaneous or wild behaviors, Tristan was solid as a rock. He has kept that maturity and stoic nature up through his high school years. Matt Vallis recalled how Tristan, whether he knows it or not, was the rock of our wild homeroom. When craziness occurred, a simple glance towards Tristan was always very reassuring. I can certainly attest to this being the case, having made that same glance myself. Kelly McDowell wrote of Tristan, 
I believe that the quality that separates Tristan even from other highly skilled and capable students is his maturity. He poless possesses a level of sophistication, both academically and socially, that is truly rare for his age. Tristan also possesses a wry, sardonic wit that creates some of the most absurd and creative ideas I've heard, and I've lost count a long ago of the number of times his humor just cracked me up. Usually in the form of a retort or some dry commentary, or the odd message he would leave for me on my classroom whiteboard. My first meeting with Tristan was during my sample lesson interview for my teaching position at Roper. I still remember the exact moment that I knew he was a talent. I had supplied music to a group of middle school instrumentalists to perform a sample rehearsal. The group was a mixed bag of instruments, all winds, except for Tristan on his violin. The music I supplied was in a key that most sixth grade string players haven't learned, but when I asked Tristan if he would need my help to transpose, he looked at me like I had a frog on my head and simply said, no, I can play in this key. This was my introduction to a young musician who would change the way I teach and change our music program at Roper. Our advanced string, uh, uh, chamber strings class was created as a result of Tristan pushing for more challenge. But of course, Tristan is more than simply a musician. He also loves food and food science, having watched the entirety of Alton Brown's Good Eats. He also is a local loyal and steadfast friend and brother to his sister, Annabelle. While at home, it is not uncommon to see Tristan and Annabelle playing video games together or snarking together at the TV or snarking at just about anything, really, says their mother. Tristan has received many accolades in his 18 years of life. He has performed with the Civic Youth Ensembles for close to a decade, was selected for the MSBOA All-State Orchestra every year he was eligible, was accepted to 100% of the music schools to which he applied, and received close to $100,000 in combined scholarship offers. He has composed music with his friends for school projects, such as a score to go along with Millier's A Voyage to the Moon for his film class. He composes just for the love of composing, and has expressed interest in possibly composing for video games. I, would I could continue to sing his praises for much longer, but in the interest of brevity, I will close by saying that teaching and knowing Tristan has been, been one of the great honors of my career. I will miss him very much as he moves on to study viola and composition at the Cleveland Institute of Music in the fall. But I'm sure that I will continue to hear of his works and accomplishments and I can't wait. Several years ago, Brian Durst, our IT manager, started getting emails from a lower school student asking about the technology used at the school. After some correspondence, he invited the student to take a field trip to look at the server room. Brian thought it would be interesting for a stage four student to see cables and blinking lights. Little did he know that the student was our very own Chris Van who, at the age of about 10, promptly asked Brian if he had any virtual server implementations. Brian was dumbfounded, asking the kid, how old are you again? If you've ever met Chris Van and mistaken him for a faculty member, you are not alone. Chris has been working tirelessly for years to shape the school's technology decisions and policy, and he has found solutions for many teachers' computer woes along the way. Chris's friend Stephen Raphael notes that Chris is often the first person who will come to the rescue when someone is having computer troubles. Our benevolent tech hero doesn't simply wait to triage, though. Chris's senior project this year was dedicated to educating students about the proper use of technology. He presented to the entire student body and provided resources for them to understand the gravity of their exposure to social media and their contributions to an online identity. Unlike some gifted, computer-oriented smarties, Chris has also been blessed with the ability to relate to just about anyone. Abha Deering keenly noted that his ability to distill many situations down to their integral parts is invaluable and unifying. At the same time, his wit and warmth through the years developed to prove his deep empathy for his comrades. For Chris, these aren't two separate parts of his brain working to complement each other. It's his deep knowledge of all things, his walking Wikipedia personality, that helps him relate. Chris, Chris uses this intuition to gain a true understanding of others, 
to challenge long-held beliefs and ideals and to find a common ground in order to forge ahead. He is a visionary this way. He doesn't only want to find the problem and create a solution. He wants to unite people by bridging the gaps in their understanding, making things better than anyone ever thought they could be. Mike Reddy describes his peacemaking and problem-solving attitude, saying, His insight, planning, and ability to foresee multiple outcomes is well beyond most students. What starts as Chris's effort to sift through the many possibilities of any situation turns into a long, exploratory conversation with friends about life and what comes next. Whether it's on a ride home from track practice with Will or out by a campfire with Christian and pals, Chris can turn any chat into a meaningful excavation of curiosities and wonder. Chris's empathetic nature and tendency to consider all paths make him the perfect companion for the soul, those soul-searching moments, the kind that fortify friendships and form lifelong bonds. Perhaps the most exciting thing about Chris is considering what he will do in the future. Chris's friends point out that there truly are no limits. Stephen notes that Chris's passion for technology is motivated by pure curiosity, while Caleb Bardis lauded Chris as having the intelligence of Wozniak and the creative taste of Jobs. Christian Henderson admired Chris for his lofty goals that he always sets and the drive he has to see them through to the end. No matter what path Chris takes in the wide world of technology, I know that Chris will use his innovative approach to better the world. As Bill Gates famously said, as we look ahead, leaders will be those who empower others. And that is exactly what Chris has mastered here at Roper. This fall, Chris heads off to Purdue University to study data science in his pursuit to make the world a better place through his love of technology. I'm so honored to present to you Roper graduate and fellow Boilermaker, Christopher Stephen Bann. Purple Tentacles A Swirl, Annalise Ingraham played the conniving sea witch Ursula in last November's Community House production of The Little Mermaid, winning at least one lifelong fan and my four-year-old son. Six days later, she brought fully grown audiences to tears with her portrayal of the tragically tender Adele in the RTC's production of A Man of No Importance. This span of performances shows a lot about Annalise's artistic versatility, and more importantly, about her Herculean investment in the work and community she finds meaningful. She not only owns the spotlight because of the timbre of her lovely voice, but also the ways in which she has chosen to utilize it. Before I heard Annalise sing, I saw her lead. Annalise was in my inaugural Changing the Narrative class, and we were assembling a major project inspired by the work of MacArthur Fellow Anna Devere Smith, a 200-page book representing Roper Voices, which the students were planning to present to Dr. Smith herself when she visited the school. In the final days of production, Annalise, despite being one of the youngest in the class, was a de facto captain, FaceTiming absent class members, helping others edit their work, and leading by example with her own meticulous submissions. The final project was one of the most impressive student efforts I've ever seen, and Annalise's work was a major part of its success. That unselfish offering of time and energy is pure Annalise. Last spring, she was one of the architects of the Junior Senior Dinner, and her role as cruise director of the nautical-themed event was an on-point characterization of the way she contributes to the Roper community. Math teacher Kevin Kildia remembers meeting Annalise when she was a student rep on his search committee. It was obvious to me that she took the role very seriously and knew that she had a responsibility to make an informed decision. After accepting the job, Kevin continued to connect with Annalise about Roper fundamentals, noting, I felt her compassion both for me and for the school. Annalise's senior project, which included spearheading Alumni Day and creating an archive of Roper's past student projects, speak to her devotion to something well beyond the moment. She wants to leave everything better and stronger than how she found it. Annalise endeavors to make Roper the school she knows it can be, and as a result, she actively participates in her own education rather than waiting to be directed. She designs extensions of work, creates independent studies, and strives to make each class experience purposeful. Max Collins reflects, I could always count on Annalise to identify snarls in upcoming projects, to speak up about them, and to offer helpful suggestions. She doesn't accept the path of least resistance. She demands high quality, but expects to put in the time for it. Those who know Annalise understand how this determination can become tenacious. She stands up for what she believes in, especially when she feels people are getting treated unfairly, says Emma Goldschmidt. She is one of the most passionate and strong-willed people I know. If she wants something, she can get it through pure determination, agrees Griffin Honecky. 
She will fight for anything and everything, no matter how small. No problem is, is insignificant to her. She cares about everything that comes her way, affirms Kate Deroney. Whatever the situation, if you need an outright boss on your side, Annalise is your true leading lady. But this isn't because she loves a fight. Sister Maureen explains that Annalise's bravery and advocacy is rooted in something much more sincere. She can be vulnerable and empathetic. She has been through a lot in her life, so she understands what you're going through. And if not, she tries to understand and listen. That empathy allows Annalise to support others in a way that Michael McConville describes as fiercely loyal and unapologetically authentic. While for most of us, Annalise's most memorable performances might be her show-stopping solos, I think it's a duet from the middle school production of Oliver that is the truest indicator of her as a performer and a person. Calvin Watry, her partner for that duet, shares that when he was hesitant and error-prone, Annalise was patient and kind. Her own moment in the spotlight was secondary to Calvin's description of her as one of the most supportive friends I have. And as a school, Roper would agree. It is my honor to present Roper graduate Annalise Rose Ingraham. Whether it is through her artwork and photographs, her words or her actions, Veronica is all about making life more beautiful and just for those around her. Veronica is truly an artist, stage four teacher Elise Lind wrote. She doesn't just sign her name, she embellishes it. She loves any project that speaks to her creativity. She made every project that she created look effortlessly gorgeous, our teacher Sarah Mendes says, but in fact, she put a ton of thought and work into each piece, especially her climate change inspired protest print. Veronica will always have creativity front and center when making subject matter and composition decisions, photography teacher Michelle Stamler says. It's almost scary to wonder what she could accomplish if she were to be in class every day. When Veronica was in stage three, she discovered that writing was another avenue that allowed her to reveal her creativity as well as layers and levels of insight. Each page of her moon journal is unique and so reflective of Veronica's creative spirit, teacher Kathy Wilmers wrote. She even included a knitted moon hiding in a pocket for one of her pages. When addressing Veronica's work in her class, English teacher Susanna Nichols shared, at so many points this semester, I've marveled at the depth and heart that you've displayed in your responses. That same depth and heart shows in Veronica's love and support of her family and friends. Her care of friends is unmatched and almost to a fault, school psychologist Rayanne Young says. Friend Hannah Wise agrees. If V knows one of her friends needs her, she will do everything in her power to be there for them. Medina Garvin remembers when a group of friends spent the night at Veronica's house. We were all playing with her bunny and I had an allergic reaction. While everyone was laughing because I looked ridiculous with my eyes all swollen, she made me pancakes and got ice for my face. She shows unconditional love to people who are blessed enough to receive it, friend Sophie Stack says. And last but not least, Sophie adds, I see her being a powerful voice for people who may not feel like they can speak up. She is a natural born leader. Veronica's leadership skills were noted by Elise. Veronica is often sought after to lead an activity and she welcomes this role. Veronica can quickly assess the strength of those around her and understands how to utilize those strengths so the group can accomplish the goals set before them. Michelle feels that any class Veronica is a member of becomes a more cohesive group, supportive of each other, focused and dynamic, and much of that I attribute to Veronica's presence. As captain of the girls' volleyball and basketball teams, Veronica, a.k.a. Team Mom, used these strengths to pull her teams together in high school. She makes you think a lot about what's right and wrong and the way you treat people, Hannah says. She pushes everyone that she meets to be better. She has a strong conscience, Brother Nick says, and she will do what she knows to be the right thing, even when she's told not to. Friend Josh Venz recalls, one year we went to a carnival. As we got in line, a lot of people started cutting in. Veronica attempted to reorganize the line and create a new pattern. The best part of that for me was the fact that Veronica was simply only cared about what she thought was just. Veronica will attend Wayne State University this fall as a psychology major. When asked what he sees his sister contributing to the world, Nick wrote, much needed kindness. I am proud to present Veronica Kate Lyon. In life, try as we may to be sensitive and clued in, we are often unaware of how we affect others. This is human and unavoidable. Even the most observant among us cannot 
always be sure of how others read us or the kinds of feelings we inspire. Sometimes others notice the little things that we do, of which we may not even be aware. And sometimes these little things say more about our character than we could imagine, more than we intend to say. When we think about it, it is not only the grand gestures that define us, but also, and perhaps more importantly, the little things. If indeed one's character is the summation of the little things, then Johnny Miliato's character is strong. Johnny, I have come to know you over the years through the many little things that have revealed you to me. The countless times that you've stepped up to help someone with a task or supported your classmates or contributed to our homeroom. Knowing you as I do, I would guess that most of these moments did not inspire much thought or conscious effort. They are simply the natural results of the kind of person you are. Generous, supportive, encouraging, open-minded. One could argue that two of the most essential qualities of true intelligence are humility and being a good listener. In a very noisy world where lots of people talk and some enjoy hearing themselves talk, you, Johnny, are different. A standout not because you self-servingly or self-aggrandizingly claim center stage, but because you share the qualities of the truly intelligent, humility, and being a good listener. Your mother Beth agrees. She calls you a loyal friend with a good listening ear. She also says that you've taught her to let things unfold rather than forcing them, and that you've always done this without saying much about it. This is right in line with the natural inclination that I, along with your other teachers, peers, and Roper community, have noticed about you. The tendency to do the little things without need of recognition or attention. The great irony is that it is precisely through your lack of need for these things that people take notice of you. You've never needed the fanfare, Johnny, and I know that you don't even want it. You are more comfortable taking the side road than the main thoroughfare, more comfortable with the subtleties than the obvious. This is what endears you to others, what others appreciate about you, and what makes you such an engaging person. And so it is with pride and a deep appreciation for the little things that I congratulate you and wish you all the very best at Michigan State University. It began in a galaxy long, long ago. Okay, it was in stage four and I was teaching the Roper philosophy. There was an intense student who listened with all of her soul, making connections quickly and deeply. Knowing what I was gonna say before I was gonna say it, she was on a plane much higher than me. I thought, who in the hell is this kid? And where is Anna Marie when you need her? How do you summarize Emma Wine? Calderwood said I should just take it easy, just list her negative points so I wouldn't have to do much. I wouldn't get out of this ceremony alive if I started Emma Wine, bad person. No one attempts more, no one does more. Inside of Roper, student government moderator, class pres, athlete, playwright, director, actor, video maker, social justice leader, diabetes and Tourette's educator, mensch. Outside of Roper, working on getting the Earn Sick Time initiative on the ballot, joining Detroit Jews for Justice and becoming a respected leader while working on workers' rights, regional transit, immigration, racial justice, education, and water as a human right, serving on Detroit Youth Leadership Task Force and many political campaigns. I could just keep listing her accomplishments all day, but Emma doesn't want that kind of speech. Oops. As Lori Lutz remembered Emma running campaigns outside of Roper, as Linda Vernon, a person who used to work at Roper, and the handsome Mary Pence remembered Emma leading student government, they were blown away by her incredible ability to organize people through collaboration and shared decision making. How can she be so good at leading? Well, preparation, strong reliance remembering the goals, Masterful ability to blend working from a plan, actively listening, and adjusting quickly. Emma respects others enough not to waste their time and to utilize their talents and ideas. 
willing to do the tedious work like a Mary Ann. Emma is also a visionary like a George or Anna Marie. The core of our philosophy is that we are all on individual journeys, discovering who we are and creating where we are going. We do so within a community, both for the benefit and the help of others, knowing we cannot soar without others and they without us. Everyone knows Emma says she is the most generous, humble person imaginable. She benefits herself by empowering others. Her life denies the false dichotomy between individual success and community welfare. She is developing her inner self as her soul yearns for justice and success for all. Emma just believes in the Roper philosophy more than most of us. Therefore, she lives it more than most of us. Are there dangers awaiting Emma? One who attacks life with zest is likely to bite off too much. Emma realizes this and knows only by prioritizing can she keep afloat. There will be times she gets it wrong, but she will autocorrect eventually. Remember the lesson of George Bernard Shaw, St. Joan. People with high ideals, intensity, sensitivity, those who take principal positions, who stand out from the crowd, are going to get hurt and sometimes burned at the stake. People will be jealous, will be disappointed, will be irritated by being told they could do better. They'll be threatened by the change that the few champion and by their refusal to avert their eyes from injustice. Is Emma heading towards illusions being smashed and cynicism growing within her soul? I don't think so. Despite her rep for being the world's nicest person, she's one tough cookie, never an attention hog. She quietly analyzes the situation, listens to others, gains allies, makes battle plans, and most importantly, never forgets what she believes in. The power of her principles is strong and her core rock hard. As Emma goes off to Wellesley, her only professed goal is to embrace life. She leaves a supportive, loving community a better place. She will join and create new supportive, loving communities who will be amazed by her just as Roper has been. I give you Emma Wine. When contacting folks to write this speech, every one of Cameron Gorelick's friends described him as creative, funny, and kind. As a creative beast, Cameron is the originator of Cheesy Carrots, the father of Drowsy Flies, and the namer of Grundlebunk. Four years ago, when the Muse's layout editor resigned unexpectedly at the beginning of the school year, I tapped Cam because I knew of his interest in graphic design and layout. And despite being a freshman, Cameron rose to the challenge and the position. Cam says that with the encouragement of his teachers, Roper has shown him that his limits are far greater than he thinks. Throughout upper school, Cameron continued to design for the Muse and eventually Tuna Talk as well. And as an upperclassman, he trained our upcoming layout editors to use InDesign. Cameron is a gamer and his creativity is also demonstrated frequently in this arena. In creative writing D&D, he immersed his players in a time-traveling mystery, and as a spectator at the gaming table, Cameron convinced Clyde's barbarian to seduce and ultimately wed the final enemy boss. Cameron is funny, undoubtedly, flashing the leg, punning, curating his friend's quote board, just hanging out in the stairwell as Ezra Carmanos recalls. Many of his friends' most memorable moments with Cam involve laughing. Laughing with Tristan in art history regarding nude Greek statues. Laughing in the escape room back with the queer sphere over mating dolphins. In our homeroom, we game most days, catchphrase being a favorite. Rather than compete and offer clues as part of the circle, Cameron would sit, or more often lay, in the middle of the circle, distracting us by blurting out incorrect but hilariously clever answers. But friend and fellow Grundlebunk Avery Long observes of Cameron, amidst the silliness, there is a continuing thread of support Cameron extends for his friends. For me, he's attended multiple performances of mine, always been congratulatory of my successes, and even embroidered a personalized who's on first fabric as a holiday gift. And that's just me. His compassion extends beyond simple loyalty. Rather, it is an active care that unites and endears him to those he keeps close. Cam is also kind to cats. 
Cameron loves cats. He is frequently flashing about pictures of his cats. He volunteers time to care for shelter cats. When spending an afternoon touring a Maori village in New Zealand, Cameron found, befriended, and photographed the village cats. For my part, I would add to this enumeration of Cameron's qualities, adventurous. Between Cameron and me lies the bond of shared experience. In addition to the ninth grade trip to DC, Cameron and I have traveled together halfway around the world, to Japan, New Zealand, Australia, and Hawaii. I will always remember hugging redwoods together in Rotorua, dodging the feisty teeth of deer in Nara, dipping our toes into the Pacific as we strolled down the beach in Hakone. I remember Cameron and Julia shuffling off to catch rare Pokemon near the harbor in Auckland, and Cam collecting plushies everywhere we'd go. Next year, Cam will venture up north to Michigan Tech to study English and history, hoping eventually to pursue a master's degree in library science. Wherever Cameron goes, fun follows. Thank you, good sir, for being you. For the good times, for your support and compassion in the not-so-good times, for gifting Zelda her first plushy dragon and D20, for giving name to the special bond our homeroom shares. It is my honor to present Roper graduate Cameron Gorlick. Three years ago, when Seth Katzman walked into my high school debate class his sophomore year, I didn't know who he was. Now that's pretty normal the first time you meet someone, but I had met Seth four years earlier and had worked with him for three years throughout middle school. He was memorable in his humor and his unself-conscious way that he kind of rolled through life. Well, I wrote it off to a quirk of memory and then forgot about it for three years until I read through his high school grade reports. And it turns out that Seth had, in fact, undergone a radical transformation in the middle of ninth grade. Kelly Piontek wrote, you became a different student second semester, and it's transforming you into a different person. As the term progressed, you came across as so much more confident and vibrant and content. It is as though something has been churned up inside you, and you are glowing from being more engaged in your education and with the community. In your book, Linda Vernon wrote, You can be proud of the progress you made during the year, from a semi-timid photographer to a self-confident layout artist. I was impressed with your strong sense of responsibility and your always positive attitude. And Matt Vallis wrote, Quite frankly, you were one of my most improved students ever. So many things turned around and you were clearly a man on a mission and in command of your own learning. Well, Seth remembers his lower school years as some of the happiest in his life. He says that he loved the ways that the lower school teacher centered school around the intrinsic love of learning. Stage four teachers Aisha Bali and Julie Nemchik said that Seth can be a big picture thinker who likes to see how the pieces fit together and how one action can affect the whole world. Seth currently plans to see how pieces fit together in the human brain as he studies neurobiology at the University of Michigan, an interest that began in stage three and was reinforced in Laura Panic's neurobiology class. Now, as much as he has changed since sixth grade, Seth has remained remarkably the same in his idealism and humor. Retired stage three teacher Mary Windrum sent Seth a graduation card where she wrote, Dear Seth, you came quietly into stage three with your lovely eyes and a sense of humor. You were and are sensitive and miss nothing. Don't lose those qualities. Well, Mary would be proud to know that you have kept those qualities and have grown further as a leader in the B'nai B'rith Youth Organization and as a lover of learning in general. Seth, high school was tough and you pushed yourself through it. While you might think that some of your success can be attributed to turkey jerky bribes, Matt Vallis put it most aptly when he wrote, although turkey jerky is always appreciated, know that bribery was never needed, as you and you alone caused your success. It was your consistent tenacity as a student, it was your love and curiosity for learning, and it was your consistent and positive attitude. Such traits will take you far. Seth, you should be proud. According to Bulbapedia, 
The Pokémon Trico is a calm and cool creature that is not easily upset. It's also bold enough to stare down Pokémon larger than itself. It seems of little wonder, then, that Julia identified Trico as her favorite Pokémon. As Annabelle stated, Julia is better than most of the people I know, and she's also one of the nicest people I know, even though she's scary at times. Perhaps we should replace scary with intense, but Annabelle's point is taken that many great things can come wrapped up in one small package. Humor, intellectual prowess, kindness, and confidence. Anyone who has met Julia knows of her ponderful sense of humor and her appreciation of the absurd. The long con is no sweat for Julia, from the ongoing saga of Pierre the Butcher to Edgar Allan Poe puns and mole puns, not to mention her passionate debates with Liam on the merits of the cute Pokémon like Trico. Julia holds on to the playfulness of her younger self. As a complement to her wry sense of humor, Julia has a serious focus and intensity. She finds herself taking the most challenging classes strictly because they are the most challenging. She wants to prove that she can do it. Julia settles for nothing less than her personal best, and she does not mimic or repeat what was presented in class. She must do the work herself and in her own and earnest way. While her perfectionism sometimes delays her initiation of a task, the results are worth the wait. Julia is a savvy mathematician, a keenly observant scientist, an all-state flutist, and a writer with an authentic voice. In chemistry, I was always taken aback by how much Julia could squeeze onto one page. It was almost as if she were running a zoning commission and every assignment had its own carefully allocated plot of real estate on the paper, allowing an entire chapter of homework to fit onto a single page. Julia can convey so much knowledge and depth in just a few words and minimal space. She plans carefully. And yet, Julia demonstrates an easygoing nature with her friends, enjoying the simplest pleasures of walking to sea after school on Fridays or volunteering at a cat shelter or countless inside jokes, zany traditions like fancy wine and cheese lunches and Vivaldi Day, which must be commemorated with Bumpy Cake. Julia is equally comfortable in absurd hypotheticals as she is in deep philosophical conversations. As Claire wrote, Julia has helped me understand that companionable silence is a real thing and just how wonderful it is. Tristan describes Julia as a steadying presence in our friend group. Like Trico, Julia is a calm and cool creature. Avery stated, if you showed the 12th grade Julia to the 9th grade Julia, she'd remark, I don't know if this is me or not. It has certainly been a pleasure for me to observe the incredibly shy freshman Julia evolve into the confident, grounded, and 4th grade Julia, who is now a Roper graduate. While I know from her running joke in French that Julia would end this speech with adieu, goodbye forever, I hope that this is only a bientôt. See you soon. Julia, I wish you the best of memories in your new academic home at Kalamazoo College, and may this goodbye be temporary and your future hellos be many. It is my pleasure to present Roper graduate Julia Catherine D'Agazio. Stephen is, I think I can say without fear of contradiction, not the kind of person you fail to notice. From the moment I saw him as a small sixth grader with a crooked smile, there was something about him that caught my eye. I'm not alone. His mother describes him as having a curiosity about everything around him. He has the makings of a researcher and will be able to contribute something important to society someday, be it medical, scientific, or a technological discovery. Stephen may not remember the first time we interacted, but I know I'll never forget it. I have been invited to give a presentation at the Roper Rocket Boosters Club on the Alcubierre Drive, a proposal for a warp speed engine that was consistent with Einstein's theory of relativity. While giving my presentation, Stephen raised his hand. A few seconds later, he was hopping in his seat. About 10 seconds after that, he was pacing up and down the room, rocking and almost crying. Emery Pence finally said, and now Andrew's going to let Stephen ask a question because he does not like to wait. His question, to paraphrase slightly, was something along the lines of, how the heck is this even possible? Wouldn't it just kill everyone and everything around it? That's the thing about Stephen. He's not the kind of person who will let others talk about things he does not understand. He will want to dig deep and get to the heart of the problem. I knew I wanted to have this kid in my homeroom. 
In fact, he may be the only student I've ever had who I told that I might be offended if he asked to go somewhere else. I remember him in my intro physics class as a freshman where I gave him permission to stand up and walk around the room during my lessons as an accommodation to work out that anxiousness until his parents pointed out at a conference with him smiling sheepishly at me that he hasn't had to do that for a while. I remember him in my advanced physics and modern physics classes where he was able to dominate the conversation with those ever-piercing questions and a refusal to accept any answer that did not make complete sense to him although I'm pleased to say that he hasn't got, he's gotten a lot better at not getting upset if, he doesn't, if it does not make sense immediately. I remember him deciding on his very own accord to sign up for Physics Olympiad, a very challenging competition, and without any help from me, was able to place in the second round. He repeated the feat this year, and we were going to try and do better, but then the COVID crisis happened. This was in addition to several other math competitions that he participated in ever since his middle school days. I watched him run his computer programming class for his senior project, where he not only helped several middle schoolers learn the Python programming language, but did it while dealing with the students, administrators, and families that were struggling with the whole distance learning experience. I saw him taking more and more of a leadership role in robotics, winning competitions, and learning how to succeed at a trial and error techniques of engineering, not to mention becoming much better at understanding his and others' feelings and emotions as he worked on the team. But when I asked others about him, most talked about his humility and personability. His mother says, given all of his academic gifts, he never brags or discusses his successes. He is always happy to help others and is never judgmental. Avery Long talks about how he always joins the Cotton Eye Joe dance, comes out, comes in out of nowhere with his witty remarks, slyly reads politics on his free time, and is, all in all, a multidimensional human being who I enjoy spending time with. Chris Ban called him my oldest friend from stage three, with a very keen sense of humor that really came out in upper school. Sarcasm is perhaps most humorous simply because you aren't expecting it. Next year, Stephen will need to lower his standards while he attends the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he will have to slow down to let them catch up to him. He plans to study computer science and mathematics, and maybe we can convince him to do a little physics while no one's looking. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor to present Roper graduate and, according to Avery Long, future three-time Nobel Prize winner, Stephen Raphael. We know our gifted students are asynchronous in their learning profiles. Many have exceptional strengths in particular scholarly areas, and as teachers, we can often view these students through a defined and narrow lens. My friend Blake Botese is a student who could have easily been perceived in such a limited manner. Yet, what I love most about our school is the opportunity it provides our gifted students to push, test, and extend themselves. And what I love most about Blake is his willingness to challenge himself, even when it was uncomfortable to experience new and interesting areas of growth. There isn't an advanced math or science class that Blake has missed in his time at Roper. From his early days in the lower school, Blake challenged himself to complete advanced levels, often finding himself in a classroom where he was the youngest person in the class by several years. When it came to mathematics, Blake voraciously consumed all that we had within the lower, middle, and upper school, and eventually sought out university summer courses to push and extend his passion for problem solving. Blake immerses himself in STEM content. There aren't enough facts or subject matter available to share with him. While many of us would prefer to never encounter summative assessments, Blake thrives on the opportunity to share his knowledge and to demonstrate his mastery of the material. It doesn't matter if it's a standardized test like the AP or a cumulative class exam. If the subject area is advanced science or math, Blake is ready to share his incredible depth of knowledge. With all of this amazing knowledge and strength in these left brain pursuits, I can honestly share that my strongest and fondest memories of Blake are in the humanities and in the time I've had to watch him grow and mature into a young adult. Picture a young middle school student surrounded by high school age competitors in a debate competition. 
For most early adolescents, being the youngest participant in such a setting would be intimidating. For many students, they might see the opportunity to just be present and to learn from older peers as the reason for attending the event. Not my friend Blake. No, this young middle schooler was in it to win it. There was no sign of intimidation, except perhaps on the faces of his high school opponents. My young friend, barely able to see above the podium, presented facts and supporting arguments that made the opposing upperclassmen warn the next set of challengers that the little guy from Roper was the real deal, and he was going to eat their lunch. You could see high school competitors trying to avoid getting paired with Blake. They didn't know whether to be embarrassed there to stand with this young student, to be humbled by the fact that he was the strongest competitor on the stage, or to just kind of slink away. I saw this tenacity play out when Blake took my political philosophy class on the nature of justice. Blake was and is his intense self when it comes to argument, and that provides him actually with clarity and poise. He loves to read and consume volumes of information that serve as reference points when he finds himself in a debate or discussion setting. His recall of factual information combined with his competitive passion is a challenging mix for any classmate that chooses, chooses to take him on in a debate. We had so much fun discussing these elements of justice and working through legal hypotheses. The hypotheticals that semester were fascinating. Blake joined me for an independent study on the nature of power the very next semester. I have to say, I met my match as he pushed me to think about Hobbesian and Machiavellian notions of power in ways that challenge my understanding of leadership. Perhaps my favorite memory of Blake is not academic, but rather social instead. Anyone who spends any time with Blake knows he leans toward being an introvert. And so it was with both surprise and a deep sense of joy that during my time as a chaperone for this year's homecoming dance, I saw Blake arrive in his suit and tie, ready to spend the evening with his classmates. He and I spent some time together that night talking, and I could tell by both his voice and his body language the high level of discomfort this social event was causing him. During one of our conversations, he shared with me that he was going to be there until the dance ended, that he had promised himself to see it through. For Blake, this was a moment of personal challenge and genuine maturity. He knew himself well enough to know that he would be uncomfortable. And he also knew that being part of the school community on this occasion was important. He knew that he had control of the moment and could leave whenever he chose. But staying was valuable. It meant being part of something bigger than himself. I was so proud of him that night so proud of the man he had become. The Blake I met in lower school could not have made it through the homecoming dance. That Blake would likely have chosen not to attend. Maturity and self-knowledge come at different rates for different people. The beauty of the match between the Roper School and Blake Botese is that they fed each other along the academic journey. Blake has been a leader in the classroom, in chess, debate, quiz bowl, he stretched himself and us to be better at serving the needs of a gifted mind. In return, Roper has provided a nurturing setting for Blake to mature, to find his voice, and to understand the complexity of who he is as an individual. We are both stronger for the bond that we work together to create. So when Christian asked me to write a senior speech, I was truly honored. Then I quickly panicked. What am I gonna say about this kid? I've never written a senior speech before, and this is Christian, a boy who was in almost every show I worked on here at Roper. I can't let him down. So I thought, well, what do I know about him? He likes basketball and musicals.
Since I know next to nothing about basketball, I figured I'd go the musical route. And I thought, hey, why not make the speech a musical? Christian once told me that he would love to play Pippin one day, so I figured he'd appreciate where most of these songs come from. There's a lot you can learn by listening to the lyrics of a show tune. So let's see what kind of advice we can give Christian before he leaves Roper. Hi, Tari. Hello. You directed Christian in middle school. Do you have any advice for him before he starts college in the fall? When you are as old as I, my dear, and let's hope that yeah, you Yeah, that's great, but are. this is only a three-minute speech. Can you cut to the chase? Oh, it's time to start living. Time to take a little from this world we're given. Time to take time, for spring will turn to fall. In just no time at all. Christian, you've worked so hard to get to this next step. Take the time to enjoy every moment. Thanks, Tari. Now let's see what Abha has to say. Hi, Abha. As Christian's musical director, vocal teacher, and home advisor, do you have any parting words of wisdom for him? Yes, in fact, Alex, I do. Lord knows we've seen enough troubles already we've had our fill of gray skies. So put down the vinegar, take up the honey jar, you'll catch many more flies. Christian, you're a strong, capable young man. Your talent combined with your drive will take you far. Continue to be open to stretching yourself as an artist and as a human. I can't wait to see the great things you'll accomplish. Thanks, Abha. I think I will ask Christian's dance teacher, Amy, if she has anything she'd like to say. Amy, hi. So for Christian's senior speech, I'm collecting words of wisdom from musicals. Do Hold you... on. I got you, Alex. <laughs> Amy, that was perfect. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Christian, you are a natural mover. You perform a strength when you almost threw Zoe through the lights. Power, finesse, and virtuosity. So grateful for your enthusiastic engagement with the Roper Dance community. And I wish you health, happiness, and success as you embark on your new academic adventure. As we say in the dance world, Mared. Thanks so much, Amy. Oh, look, I'm, I'm getting another call. I gotta go. Thanks again. Hello? I heard you were writing a musical. I'd like to audition. <laughs> well, it's not really a musical. I'm just adding some songs to Christian's senior speech. It's about Christian? I love that kid. <gasps> Let's see, I've choreographed him in Greece, Oliver, A Man of No Importance, Peter and the Star Catcher, Into the Woods, and Pippin. Oh, I know exactly what to use for my audition piece. Think about the sun, Christian. Think about her golden glance. How she lights the world up. Well, now it's your chance with the guardians of splendor inviting you to dance. Christian, think about the sun. Christian, I love you so much. Thanks for all the joy that you've brought. I'll miss your incredible memory and attention to detail and dances. I wish you all the best. You're on the right track. Thanks, Molly. We'll be in touch. Great! So how much is the pay? Is it equity? When do we start?
So, as you can see, Christian, you have had a huge impact on a lot of us here at Roper. Rest assured, you will not be forgotten. I know for a fact I will still cringe whenever someone comes into the theater shouting my name. Or runs away with my oversized coffee cup. If I can't take my coffee break, something with it. Even though your time here at Roper has come to an end, you are destined for bigger and greater things. Enjoy your time as a musical theater major at Illinois Wesleyan in the fall. Go out and make new friends. And take advantage of every opportunity presented to you. You will always be a part of the Roper family. And we are just a phone call away. Congratulations, kiddo, you did it! You are now officially a Roper graduate class of 2020. You've got magic to do. Yes, you do. You've got miracle plays to play. You've got parts to perform, hearts to warm, kings and things to take by storm. As you go along your way. Cameron, thank you so much for choosing me to give your speech. It's an honor to have the last words about you as a student and the first words about you as a fellow alumnus. I've known you since I chaperoned the Tamarack trip when you were in stage four, and in some ways you've changed greatly. In other ways though, you're the exact same kid with a smile as wide as his head. I still remember being so impressed listening to you talk about your passion for cars and go-karts even back then. When you asked me to advise your senior project, I was happy I'd get the chance to learn even more about you and your passion. Based on what I've gathered, racing is about going fast when you get the chance, only slowing down when you absolutely have to, and most of all, about staying in control. For a senior project, Cameron decided to demonstrate control off the track for a change. So he took out and replaced the engine of his Mazda Miata, in addition to a bunch of other work which I, quite frankly, don't understand. This year, I got to see Cameron meticulously disassemble, clean, and successfully reinstall parts of a car that I didn't even know existed. Cameron, you showed incredible attention to detail and your patience in this work. I am so proud of you. You may not realize this, but you didn't just demonstrate control on the track and in the garage. Being a leader in the Roper community takes the same patience, understanding, and attention. You're, always the, you're not always the loudest voice in the conversation, but when you talk, people listen you rise to the challenge. Aaron Robinson made particular note of it too. Cameron is a complex young man who listens to those who come before him, but don't let them define him. He is open to discussion, revision, growth, and change within himself, and his ideas about his place in the world. Basically, Cameron, we all want to hear more from you. Despite having just a rudimentary understanding of racing, I have some unsolicited advice. Take time off the track to look back and appreciate every moment. The easy and the hard, the fast and the slow. Try to learn everything you can from both success and failure. And remember that even if it's not your favorite track, you're still racing in it. Cameron, I hope that you think of your life like a racetrack. The moments you zoom through are fun and exciting, but they don't always teach you that much. Making mistakes, running in the challenging courses, learning and growing gradually. That's what life is about. Remember to look back on your mistakes and your triumphs and appreciate both equally. No matter how slow it feels, you're still in the race. But most importantly, you're always going to have your family and friends on the sidelines to cheer you on. You say, I love racing for the speed and the feeling of control. I love being able to go as fast as I can and be able to turn and stop exactly as I plan. Cameron, it's the first lap down with the rest of your life to go. You are in control. Remember that no matter where you race off to, we're back here cheering you on. Family and friends, I'm honored to present mechanic, race car driver, and Roper graduate, Cameron Alexander Robinson.
Last December, I had the honor of seeing Cooper Blankenberg dance the role of the Sugar Plum Fairy in the Michigan Ballet Theater's production of The Nutcracker. I'll never forget this, not because she was dancing a role that the company often hired a professional to perform, or because of the incredible athleticism and grace she demonstrated with each pirouette, but rather because she had a radiant smile on her face the entire time. It's rare to see anyone do anything with such a sense of ecstatic purpose. Doing what you're born to do, living your best life, all those adages feel trite until you watch Cooper dance. Initially, I thought this was something Cooper had grown into, but big sister Alex confirms, no, it's really always been like this. I cannot think of a time when she wasn't twirling around the kitchen and running into everyone, including the dog. Her first recital, she wore two big tutus, one around her waist and the other around her head. The dance was about a shy lion and she was anything but shy. I remember watching her beaming smile from the stage as she did her plies. Soon after her Nutcracker performance, Cooper took a leave from Roper in order to study ballet full-time at the prestigious Rock School. Next year, she is deferring admission from the University of Michigan in order to join the pre-professional program of the Pittsburgh Ballet. Most dancers of Cooper's caliber leave home when they're even younger than Cooper, but Cooper consciously chose to stay at Roper, and she has made the most of that decision. In my classes, I have marveled at the way the skills Cooper had to hone as a dancer translate into her academics. She is self-aware, receptive to feedback, and consistently seeking to improve. And despite engaging in hours of ballet a night, she has never used her dancing as an excuse to avoid schoolwork. She was always one of the most prepared for discussion and demonstrated careful completion of reading, even on nights I'm sure she would have preferred to sleep. Cooper is not one to compromise. She wants it all, says Jamie Benigna. She wants intellectual challenge as well as artistic expression. She experiences genuine joy in learning, even if the challenge seems insurmountable. Cooper does not rest on her laurels. She pushes ahead. Despite her academic success, the primary reason Cooper chose to stay was because of her connection to the Roper community and her relationship with her friends and family. Fortunately for us, because we're all just a little happier when we're in Cooper's presence. Whether watching RuPaul's Drag Race videos on YouTube until two in the morning with Sister Ryan, or reprogramming Annalise Ivanescu's cell phone so that the contact info from the FBI popped up when Cooper called, Cooper has a way of, as Kate Deroni put it, lighting up any room she enters. Friends recall hilarious photo shoots, song parodies, and up for anything fun. Alex adds, she has a way of turning even the most tenuous of times into happy occasions, chiming in with inside jokes or hilarious observations that make everyone smile. Just as her true love for dance isn't about the spotlight and accolades, the sheer joy she brings to her relationships isn't about the attention from a quick laugh. Cooper's consideration and care for those she loves shines through in the gratitude she shows for people. Friend and devoted study partner Alexa Miller recalls the way Cooper loves coming up with gifts for her friends, cards, snacks, playlists, for any occasion or when they are going through a tough time. Cooper is someone we're going to be watching for a long time as she makes her foray into professional dance and continues to grow in her many skills and passions. But it won't just be to marvel at her strength and artistry, Rather, we'll delight in that smile and count ourselves as the lucky ones who've been able to be part of not just her audience, but the greater performance of her life. I'm so proud to present Roper graduate Cooper Clark Blankenberg. If you have ever been to a Roper event, chances are you know Alex Calderwood. If you've performed at a Roper event, you have called on Alex to help. And if you've tried to explain what a Roper kid really is, you've probably used Alex as your shining example. The first thing you might notice about Alex is a wacky sense of style. If I had a dollar for every photo I've taken of his wild ensembles over the years, I'd have enough money to buy a drum major's outfit of my very own. Alex does not turn down an opportunity to dress for a theme. As the captain of our cruise ship for the junior-senior dinner, as a character in a musical or a short film, as our own fighting tuna, or simply for no reason at all, Alex loves to wear his creativity and give people a smile. Why not sift through trash and make a necklace out of a found Buddha statue? Perhaps the best reason to dress in this eccentric manner is because it opens the door for conversation. Alex is disarming, open, and loquacious, and he's been known to wax poetic a time or two. Catch him debating moral philosophy in class or at lunch. Hear him spit some rhymes at an open mic poetry event or spy him re rehearsing the full Gettysburg Address with Adam C.B. to add into a performance. 
Thank goodness Eric talked you out of that one. His myriad wardrobe choices match his endless desire to explore thoughts through words, through writing, and discussion. But Alex's fashion sense and gift of gab aren't his only languages. Alex is a born musician. Having picked up the drums at the age of one and learned to read music and play piano at four and a half, Alex is a virtuoso. Eric Ambrose remarked that Alex is a kick-ass drummer who brings everyone so much joy when he plays. Alex has performed at virtually every talent show, countless music, pardon me, countless school musicals, and every concert that we've had. He has, in a way, been playing the soundtrack to Roper. As a senior, he stepped into the spotlight in the musical A Man of No Importance. It makes sense that with his background in Portuguese, French, and Arabic, along with his love of phonetics and linguistics, that Alex was able to nail an Irish accent that would make my Nana proud. Not only that, but Alex's sweet, tender singing voice capped off a brilliant production. Kelly McDowell described Alex saying, Alex is that rare combination of a razor sharp artistic visionary and the most down to earth, likable person one could meet. Despite his penchant for the bizarre, Alex recounts his most meaningful time at Roper as being those days when he could explore the woods in lower school. This is at the core of Alex's splendor, a person who marvels at the oddities in life, but who also takes time to appreciate simple, peaceful pleasures hidden and otherwise overlooked. He does it with people too. At once he can be wildly amused by each and every idiosyncrasy that one has to offer, while also connecting directly to the core of who someone is. Celia Lipton might have put it best, saying, He is the weirdest man I have ever met, but he makes you feel normal and seen no matter what. Next year, Alex heads off to the residential college at University of Michigan, and it doesn't shock me one bit that he hasn't settled on a major yet. As Hale Williams said, Alex is a man of infinite surprises, so there's really no telling what he'll pursue down the road. However, one thing is for certain, it won't be boring. I'm honored to present to you the grooviest guy I know, Roper graduate Alexander John Calderwood. And then it happened. This is the Eureka Call of the wild Avery Long in its natural habitat. And these words were specifically uttered in Avery's description of the process of battling all the forces of Murphy's Law to emerge victorious in the creation of a class that arose from his senior project entitled A Very Long Climate Change Project, or AVLCP, tasked with the modest goal of saving the world starting at Roper. But let's backtrack a bit. Roper teacher Michael McConville hit the nail on the head when she observed that Avery treats each class like a mystery waiting to be solved. Indeed, whether it's winning or running a talent show, wondering what will come out of his mouth during an improv scene, competing or swing dancing at a forensics tournament, troubleshooting a robot or more troubleshooting a robot, herding the clutter of cats that is student government, or simply saving the world, Avery chooses his challenges and loves pursuing the mysteries within them. Kelly Piontek wrote, I am constantly wowed by you. You have managed to tap into something authentic, individual, and global. You are a leader in your grade and in the Roper community, and we are the better for it. The world needs more leaders like you, people who earnestly desire to make the world a better place. Avery leaves us with advice that will get us through pretty much any tough time. First, assemble the best crew possible. Surround yourself with helpers and friends. Second, open all channels for communication and keep them open. Third, failure is a necessary prerequisite to success. Every step forward counts, even the little ones. And as long as you keep trying, there is no such thing as a step backwards. And fourth, making a difference is possible. Now, at this point, I would normally conclude by saying something like Avery. If you ever need help, please remember that you have a whole community behind you. But based on the weeping and gnashing of teeth I've heard throughout our community over Avery going on to Yale in the fall to study engineering, I think it might be more comforting to say, hey, everyone, if you ever need help, please just remember that you have a whole Avery behind you. Now, it probably wouldn't be fair to Avery to have his cell phone set up as the Roper Be The Change helpline. However, he has left us with a structure, with friends to carry on a shared vision, 
and with the most concrete guidance and role modeling I have ever seen on how to be the change we hope to see in the world. Avery is ready and excited for the next set of mysteries. He says that Roper prepared him to leave Roper. And for 14 years at Roper, Avery Long has thrown his mind, body, and soul into making a difference in our community and into inspiring each of us to do the same. And then it happened. Sam Weiss is a detail man. His work on a chainmail shirt, link after link of detail work, 56,000 links to be close to precise. Every bit of the vast amount of artwork he has created, detail work. Michelle Stamler wrote, it was so obvious how much Sam loved what he was doing. It wasn't work. It was woven into his DNA. Sam would never take a shortcut or eliminate something from his vision to make his task easier. His commitment to his final images was stalwart and unwavering. That kind of attention to detail is often associated with a loner who toils over the minutia of his work. And Sam might even come across that way in some of his writing, as when he once said, without enough time for self-reflection, you fail to achieve the excellence you could have. In short, the world is too impatient for excellence. Granted, Sam can be mistaken for a curmudgeon who could be found yelling at kids to get their idealism off his front yard. And Roper alum Josh Osgood calls Sam the most cynically wholesome guy he knows. But Sam is also the quintessential man of vision, operating from a center of what Susanna Nichols calls enthusiastic authenticity. In Jeff Smith's graphic novel series, Bone, Two characters are wandering lost when one exclaims, here's your problem, we're off the map. Get a bigger map. <laughs> well, indeed, if expanding the map and envisioning a better world is the first step to creating one, I can't imagine a better imagination for the task than Sam Weiss's. In our Utopian Lit class, he presented the atmosphere on his own concept of a carbon negative invention that would use methane gas filled balloons to hold wind turbines aloft. The point was not to create a production-ready invention, but to inspire us to dream of our own solutions. Sam's work also points us inward. He and Josh Stiebel created a game for our science fiction class called Oh the Humanity, where players start off as human, but can only win by trading in their body parts for weapons and armor. If a player becomes entirely a machine, they completely lose their humanity and lose the game. Now, Sam has been at Roper for 14 years. His self-evaluation for his last art independent study summed it all up nicely when he wrote, I learned a lot and had fun doing it. What else is school even for? It is no shocker that Sam will be pursuing his Bachelor of Fine Arts at the University of Michigan to continue developing his skills as an illustrator for graphic novels, games, and other media. Sam, I look forward to the worlds you will share with us as you continue to learn a lot and have fun doing it. What else is life even for? I first had the chance of meeting Evan during his middle school years. I coached him in middle school basketball and quickly realized he had a very entertaining personality. Always very competitive, full of life, joking around and trying to stir the pot. I had recently watched the Disney movie Ice Age and thought that some of Evan's antics seemed very familiar to Sid the Sloth, the confident, loving, playful, and oftentimes annoying character. And he even looked like him too. From that point on, that was his nickname and something we joked about often. Evan's parents, Brian and Andy, had two sets of twins that attend Roper. They support him and his siblings in whatever they do. Evan's family is his priority. He would immediately seek them out at the end of each of his games, and it is rare to see a kid who bypasses his peers who want to congratulate him and go directly to his parents, siblings, and grandparents. The bond of the occasion family is something that I have always admired. His family values and support will serve Evan extremely well in the future, in whatever he chooses to do. 
As coaches, Evan was always someone we felt we could be brutally honest with because he had tough skin, was extremely competitive, and knew it would make him better. His parents supported us with this approach, trusting that Evan would only grow and get stronger as a result. The ability to accept and take action on the feedback he received helped make Evan quite an athlete, even if he didn't always look the part. Evan would show up for nearly every basketball game in his Grinch sweatpants, bedhead hair, and his arm in a sling after suffering a shoulder injury. I cannot imagine what it was like for the other teams to look at Evan before the game, only to have him score 30 points in a win against them. Evan was the MVP of the league in soccer and basketball his senior year, and he had a good shot to receive the same award in baseball if the school year had not ended short. It is not surprising that Evan had chosen to attend Michigan State University. He has been a die-hard fan his entire life. I can vividly picture Evan sitting in the Izzo section cheering on his beloved Spartans in his college years to come. He would often come to practice and inform me that he was recording the MSU basketball game at home, and I would joke with him about ruining the outcome as I was following the game live on my phone. Head basketball coach Landy Andahazy says, My favorite thing about Evan is his unshakable confidence. You can make fun of him for something he is doing that is totally ridiculous and it does not rattle him. He has the confidence and the drive to accomplish whatever he puts his mind to because he will never believe he can't do it. While I'm going to miss joking around with Sid the Sloth at practice, I'm excited to see what this drive and unshakable confidence is going to allow him to achieve in the East Lansing and beyond. Congratulations, Evan. Now, Justin Occasion is the son of Andy and Brian Occasion of Troy and brother of Evan, 2020, Griffin, 2024, and Marin, 2024. Justin is someone that we refer to as a Roper lifer, meaning he has been here since the lower school. To be exact, Justin has been at Roper for 15 years. Needless to say, Roper has played a vital role in Justin's development. If you know Justin well, you know that he holds a few things very close to his heart that he remains strictly loyal to, no matter the situation. The first thing is his love for his family, specifically his siblings. Whether he's supporting his brother Evan at various sporting events or providing guidance to his younger siblings, Marion and Griffin, Justin has a very close, unique relationship with each one of his siblings. Next, Justin, like his whole family, loves their pets, specifically his cats. On numerous occasions, occasions excuse me, I was told by his siblings, specifically Evan and uh, Griffin, about how much time Justin actually spends with his cats. Inevitably, he would come to basketball practice at some point covered in their hair. I was also amazed at the spring when I was running baseball workouts at how many different animals I saw running through the occasion household. Finally, Justin simply loved sports. He was a four-year member of the Roper baseball program, where he was a three-year starter for the team. He also was a three-year member of the Roper basketball program. This is where I had the opportunity to coach Justin for nearly three years. Justin was simply put a coach's dream. Justin has many thought after qualities that coaches look for in student athletes, but the one I appreciate the most is his determination. He was determined to get better every day, and most importantly, determined to do anything to get his team a win. This was never more evident than a game during his junior year. He was not feeling well, and it didn't look like he was going to play. He knew he was the best option I had, and when the buzzer sounded to start the game, without hesitation, Justin stood up and declared he was ready to go. To his credit, he played nearly the entire game even while having to stop multiple times to try Eve on, on the court. Now, the reason I tell this story is because it shows how determined Justin can be when he's motivated. I strongly believe that this determination was instilled in him at a young age by his parents. But I also feel that this development, that his development, excuse me, at Roper over the last 15 years has helped solidify many of Justin's strong qualities. Now, this process wasn't always straight and smooth but I know the bumps along the way have served as a learning experience for him moving forward. As he mentioned to me, the one piece of advice that he would give Roper students after his experiences was, don't procrastinate and ask for help when you need it. This quote shows the maturity that Justin has gained over the past few years, and that will serve him well moving into the future. Justin, simply put, I'm glad I had the opportunity to coach and teach you over these last five years. It was an absolute pleasure. Um, congratulations, and best of luck in the future.
It didn't take long for me to see that Jacob was special. Even in the lower school, you could see his charisma and the ability he had to draw others towards him. Fast forwarding 10 years, the little boy I saw at the lower campus hasn't disappointed. After getting to spend a lot of time with Jacob over the last four years, I can confidently say that he is one of the most gifted children that I have encountered in my 30 years at Roper. Yes, I am including sports in that statement, but that is not what I mean. His sincere ability to get along with everyone he meets and find common ground with that person is a unique gift that few people have. Jacob also understands complex concepts, instructions, and social dynamics like few Roper students can. Some of my favorite Roper moments include watching Jacob leading drills during the high performance basketball camp or playing outside with the kids at the Roper summer camp. <laughs> it's always hard to tell who is having more fun, Jacob or the campers. Jacob is so good at connecting with those around him that anyone watching can see his personality shining through. In moments like those, it is easy to understand why people are drawn to him. The caring and compassion he shows for those around him is rare. Jacob's sincerity and competitive nature also make him a phenomenal teammate. Similar to how others are pulled towards Jacob socially, I have watched as people wanted to be around him in athletics. <clears throat> Not because he's arguably the best athlete, or, but because they needed him. His teammates know how intelligent he is on the field and that Jacob would make them better for playing alongside of him. Most importantly, however, was the fact that they knew he would never let them down. Whether it was a game-winning goal in a soccer regional semifinal from 100 feet away, or a buzzer beater in basketball, Jacob always rose to the occasion. Jacob ended his junior year of sports so well, I was expecting his senior season to include being team captain and all state and league MVP candidates. I was expecting something great out of Jacob his senior year. And when he broke his leg during his senior soccer season, I thought that we were all going to be cheated out of seeing how special Jacob really was. But I was wrong. Despite being devastated by missing the ability to play his senior year of basketball, Jacob showed his coaches and his teammates what dedication really looked like. Jacob came to all of our games, he demonstrated great leadership by helping teammates with strategy, usually something I cringe when one player helps another teammate with strategy. <clears throat> but Jacob was the most intelligent X's and O's player I've coached. He challenged his teammates when they were lagging behind or needed to be confronted. Every day, whether he felt like it or not, he was at practice with a positive attitude. The team, when the team needed talking to, it was Jacob's voice that I regularly heard. That level of dedication, involvement, and impact from an injured player is something that I have never seen in my coaching career. Having Jacob involved made us a better team, and it taught me never to count someone out just because they couldn't make it on the court. I've been so proud of how Jacob handled himself this year. My entire coaching staff agrees there is nothing that Jacob could have accomplished on the court this year that could have made us think more of him than we do now. After watching Jacob these past years give the Roper community so much, I wanted to tell you that despite your successes, you owe us more. In my opinion, you have all the characteristics of a leader, and many times, leaders have to do things not for themselves, but for those around them. This is why I'm telling you that you owe it to us to continue to push yourself and those around you. You owe it to us to speak your mind and rise to the challenges ahead. You owe these things to us because we all know how smart and how talented you are. We all believe that even in the rough times, you can come out stronger than when you started. Most importantly, we are all better when you challenge yourself and you challenge us. Thank you for all of the wonderful memories and for making those around you better. Good luck in your new adventures at Saginaw Valley State. I have a plan. Now hear me out. 
One day, when I grow up and become a famous actress, I'm going to need a bodyguard. And I already have one picked out. Rory Pop. Rory is a fierce protector. And that's what I told Patty when she asked for my input for Rory's re college recommendation letter. I told her Rory is fierce. But I can let you in on a secret, mainly because Rory's out there in a the car and because of social distancing can't get up here and get to me. Rory is fierce, yet fragile. Tough, yet tender. Rory is the kind of warrior that our world needs right now. One that is thoughtful, nurturing, and kind. Rory's ferocity presents itself in many forms. Their good friend Leah Trunsky says that Rory is one of the most fiercely loyal friend people I know. I always know that I can rely on them for anything. Rory fiercely protects their friends. And don't think you have to win a popularity contest to be their friend. If you're feeling ostracized or alone, a bit on the outside, Rory will hunt you down and drag you by force into the green room of the theater scene shop where you'll feel safe and welcomed. Rory is also well-versed in self-protection. Nobody will ever be able to tell Rory who they should be. Like Rory's mom, Cindy, says, Rory won't give up their identity. Instead, they will help give the world tools to accept them. When Rory was feeling vulnerable, they decided to empower themselves by taking up Krav Maga, an Israeli form of self-defense martial arts. But it wasn't enough for Rory to feel empowered. When friend Max Yolis was also having a tough time, Rory dragged them, presumably by force, to a Krav Maga lesson. Now Max feels empowered too. Fiercely protecting their friends comes only second for Rory to fiercely protecting the truth. A fiercely gifted writer, Rory has startled English and homeroom teachers with their uncensored views that often questioned authority. Questioning authority was just a little something that Rory picked up during lower school and perfected on the Birmingham campus. Rory's writing skills, however, have also helped them to create an educational book for children as part of their AP Bio Final. The book was about biodiversity in house lawns. That brings me to another reason for Rory to get ferocious. Their fierce need to protect the environment. Rory's favorite Roper memories include picking garlic mustard out of the forest behind the lower school and enjoying a forestry class taught by Roper Senior Grace, now Charlie Kaminsky, as part of a senior project. These two activities sparked Rory's interest in forestry, sustainable living, and wildlife preservation. By stage four, Rory was not only protecting their friends and the truth, they were also beginning their life goal of protecting the earth. Rory also feels a fierce responsibility to be product productive. They simply can't be idle. Even as many of us took time during the quarantine to rest and relax, Rory was busy sewing their own clothing, making dandelion honey, studying their subscription to the Farmer's Almanac, and knitting socks for Dad. In the fall, Rory will be attending Chatham University to double major in sustainable living and journalism. This will certainly lead Rory to their dream of becoming a forest ranger, living quietly, albeit productively, in a little cabin in the woods with a dog. After a day of hard work, Rory might just write a few children's books to help kids understand how to live symbiotically with their environment. Okay. So I am nothing if not realistic. I understand that when I grow up and become a famous actress, that Roy may not want to leave the peace and quiet of her forest cabin and dog to watch over me as I go down the red carpet. However, I will always be proud to claim Lori as a fierce friend and protector. And now Roper graduate. Congratulations, Rory. I've known Josh for most of his life, as he attended Roper since he was three and is the youngest of four children who all attended Roper. His parents, Jim and Beth, have always encouraged Josh to be his own person and have fully supported him in all of his passions and interests. 
He embodies all the positive aspects of the Roper philosophy. His kindness, acceptance, sense of humor, intelligence, and respect for others make him who he is. I started coaching Josh in middle school. He was always a talented and unselfish athlete, but his other coaches and I could not be more pleased with how he stepped up as a leader his senior year. Josh was truly an extension of his coaches. When a teammate made a good play, Josh was the first to congratulate him. If someone made a mistake, Josh was always there to console, and that is part of what made Josh an exceptional teammate and leader. Athletic director Ed Sack says, Josh did not want to play soccer in high school, and he definitely did not want to be the goalie. The fact that he unselfishly did both for his friends and teammates allowed Roper to become one of the best teams in the state. Josh will go down as one of the strongest goalies in our school's history and certainly deserving of his All-State achievements. Josh will attend Denison University, a liberal arts college in Ohio, and plans to major in psychology. I was thrilled to hear this is what Josh planned to study because I think it suits his personality perfectly. Josh is a caretaker. During the last regular season soccer game, fellow senior Jacob Gladney broke his leg. The game went on, the team won, but as soon as the game ended, Josh immediately came to me distraught to ask which hospital Jacob had been taken to so he could visit him. That is the type of guy Josh is. Whatever pain or joy his friends are experiencing, he will go out of his way to support them. He is a true friend. After the soccer season ended, he sent out a message thanking all the parents for the sacrifices they made throughout the season. This was a typical Josh response. He also carried this attitude onto the basketball court. He was never concerned with being the high scorer on the team, but many games, head coach Laddie Andahazy and I would agree that he was the most impactful player because of the competitive attitude and willingness to do whatever it took to help this team win. Josh also had a strong, has a strong love for fashion. I didn't realize that mixed match shoes ripped jeans, and a feather earring were hip in 2020 until Josh tried to persuade me. Despite my multiple attempts to try to tone down Josh's attire, he would always come back the next day with an even more outrageous fit, as he would call it. Josh puts 100% of himself into whatever he does. Schoolwork, friendships, sports, fashion, and music. When he sets his mind to do something, there is no stopping him whether it is turning heads with his fits or becoming an all-state athlete. I know his strong will and compassion for others is going to lead to amazing things and enrich the lives of everyone around him. Congratulations, Josh. In 2009, there was a climate summit in Copenhagen where the negotiations unraveled and the convened countries failed to reach an agreement. Present at this event was Christiana Figueres, a Costa Rican diplomat who would go on to play an instrumental role in the successful delivery of the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement among those same 190 countries that could not reach an agreement in Copenhagen. After the devastation and fatalism from the Copenhagen failure, Christiana determined that impossible isn't a fact, but a choice and that the only approach to address challenges as monumental as climate change was to a term she dubbed stubborn optimism, a relentless, gritty, determined choice to make change because we have to. It's this last part that reminds me so much of Calvin, grit and determination in the face of change. Calvin will face frequent change over the next four years in Long Island University's Global Studies program, where he will study on three different continents over four years beginning with a host family in Costa Rica next year, studying environmental policy. Kelvin said that he selected the Global Studies program because experiencing that many cultures is important to being a well-rounded person, to understand people around you. If you don't understand how they live, you won't be able to understand their situations and find solutions to their problems. Kelvin's drive for environmental and social justice began at a very early age, from donating the proceeds of his childhood lemonade stand to the Gleaners Food Bank, to examining alternative energy and tinkering with fuel cells in his spare time. Calvin not only recognizes the faults in the status quo, he takes action to remedy those faults. As his sister Cece remarks, 
Calvin worries about things most kids don't even think about. Calvin's intensity, passion, and keen sense of justice have permeated his years at Roper. Bob Simon described Calvin as one to excel in many different endeavors, diving deeply into topics of personal interest. Add in a strong sense of justice along with the willingness to use his voice, and the result is a true riparian. To a person, everyone I interviewed for this speech remarked of Calvin's sense of justice as well as his passion. One of Calvin's passions was prominently displayed in Andrew's homeroom this year, when Andrew mentioned that there was a new makerspace and design class that would run second semester, and Calvin shot up like a lemur spotting a predator, eyes wide and head straight up, and ran out of the room to tell Hale to sign him up. Design seems well suited to Calvin. At its heart is imagining and inventing something that has not existed before, but the existence of that thing makes our experience in the world better. It's no wonder Calvin was so excited to join. Calvin builds not just things, he builds community. From leading homeroom discussions, to helping initiate rocket boosters in middle school, to managing the physics club, playing soccer, and golf practice shenanigans, Calvin can be goofy, supportive, and a leader all at the same time. As Avery points out, there isn't one finite earliest memory with Calvin. There's just a stream of good throughout. I do not know if Calvin and Christiana Figueres will cross paths in the future. I hope they do. What is clear is that her notion of stubborn optimism lives on in lifelong riparian and now Roper graduate, Calvin James Watry.